No, I can't see. These chairs are so big back here. Oh, it's so much cool around here. So can we move down? That's what Mike said he was going to do. You just have to take your name. Mike's going to move plates. Yeah. Why? People should know us, right? They might really think you're Mike. I don't know. I'm going to move right down beside you. Oh, you didn't get a bonus. <laughs> meeting to order. Thank you all for joining us tonight for this work session. The Clover School District Board of Trustees welcomes you to this special work called work session. The board meets formally twice a month, one work session and one business meeting. The work session format is as follows. Presentations posted per the agenda will be given. The board will have the opportunity for questions and discussion during each presentation. There will be time allotted for additional questions taken from members of the audience as directed by the superintendent. Those questions will be addressed during the meeting or at a later date if additional research is needed. There is no public forum during the work session. Members of the audience wishing to speak in a public setting can do so at the regularly scheduled monthly business meeting on the fourth Monday of each month. Thank you again for joining us today. And with that, Dr. Quinn, we'll turn it over to you. Okay, I want to thank everyone who's here in person tonight for the work session, as well as those who are joining us online. Uh, normally, on a work session, we're down on the floor because we are actually going to work on some things tonight. But um, because we want to make sure our audience at home can hear, we decided to have the board sit up top. So we will have presenters come um, to the podium uh, in a more formal way than we normally do. So I'm saying that to my audience out here who's been in work sessions before, and, and we'll see that it's a little bit different tonight. So we're going to start out tonight with an update uh, from our Future Ready initiatives. And this is going to be led by Mr. Brian Dillon, our Public Information Officer, as well as Ms. Stephanie Knott, our Director of Marketing and Communications. And board again, this is just an update. You will know a lot of these things, but it's still important to kind of know, you know, the next couple of weeks ahead. Good evening, Madam Vice Chair, members of the board. Uh, thanks for having us tonight. 
We will we are joining you to, to give you an update on where we are with our 2022 uh, bond campaign to, to share with the community about uh, the bond vote on November the 8th. Uh, so we'll dive right into that. First, I'm going to let you know we've got this split up in, in, into two sections. So I'll take the first section. Um, Ms. Nott will join me for the second, second section. So it's kind of technology use and personal touch use. So that's how we've got this grouped out, and we're going to share a little bit more about them uh, with you this evening. So the first bit is on our, our bond website. Uh, as you know and remember, we launched that on the 2nd of August. The website has information about the bond, the who, the what, the when, and the why. So you've got the what, which is the, the overall package. You can find details on that 156 million bond package and where the where that land is located. When the you know, that it's in, on November the 8th, and there's a countdown calculate or countdown timer on there that goes to to November 8th at 7 p.m. when the when the polls close. So you'll have that you'll see that countdown timer on there. How how much the tax calculator? There's a tax calculator on there uh, that you can go to to find what the impact is to uh, the individual in the community and how that will impact them directly. And, and why. So under resources, there's a good bit of information about why. The number of homes that are coming, the opportunities, the, the uh, enrollment dashboard, all that information you'll find under resources, and that's your why. Mr. Dillon, can I stop you there? You actually amended the tax calculator from what we had in the last bond. Will you explain that to the board? So on the, la on the, last, um, on the last bond, there was information that had um, what the increase is and how much the total is. And so we, we heard some feedback that that, that got kind of confusing at times and you were seeing those two numbers be uh, added to each other. So uh, we did some work recently to bring that down, make it considerably simple. What is the estimated approximate monthly impact? What is the estimated approximate um, yearly impact? So you'll find that for both 4% impact and 6% impact. And the 6% is brand new. Remember, we didn't yeah. try to estimate cars and those kinds of things before. We now have a calculator. We have two, one for your 4%, which is your home, and one for your 6%. So that is a brand new resource. We wanted to be sure the board knows that as well as our, our community. Uh, then you'll find uh, be able to find on there, under resources as well, social media graphics. We're utilizing the social media to uh, be able to, to reach out more, uh, stretch, our, stretch our reach out, boost some posts to, to find more people in our area that might not be following us. Uh, and we have posts that are scheduled every single Monday from now until November the 7th. So you'll find out more information. It's in a did you know format. Uh, did you know that uh, Clover School District this year had the largest enrollment? Did you know that uh, Clover High School is among the top top four largest high schools in the state. So you'll find that uh, those are also available for download for anybody that wants to share for personal use or just find out. Those are available on our resource pages. Those have been shared with uh, our principals and, and PTO. They're, they're P our principals PTO members, uh, so they have that. The principals gathered all their information so that uh, we could share it directly with PTO, so they have that and they're able to use it as well. We also have flyers. We're using Peach Jar, our flyer distribution um, tool, to share flyers. So those flyers are scheduled, have been scheduled, and they're going out on each Friday. So we have a Monday social media post. We have a Friday flyer post that goes out to everyone. Uh, and the flyers, you can see, they can get a little bit deeper. Uh, so this one in particular tells you a little bit about Clover High School. Uh, what, we, what I just mentioned there, the top five largest high schools in the state and uh, Oak Ridge Middle School is one of the top seven largest. So you'll be able to find some of those more uh, specific and detailed information on those flyers as well. We al so we also have been doing some very strategic communications. Uh, we've got done some guest columns in, in community forums, publications like the Lake Wiley uh, Chamber of Commerce magazine, which will come out uh, later in October. Um, there's also information in it going to be in the River Hills HOA newsletter, uh, the Re Piedmont Regional um, Realtors Association, we will find information that we'll be sharing with them, and the Lake Wiley Athletic Association. So uh, we're, doing, we're reaching out to, to those organizations to send information out through their channels as well. 
You also see information on our web and Facebook. So stores are going out there. You know, the, the example there was this the story right before the start of school on uh, the parking spaces at Clover High School, and that got a lot of traction. You, know, you see over 420 comments, and there was a lot of shares. It drummed up a lot of conversation, so it was a good opportunity uh, to have some two-way conversation and share bits of information. But those are some of the types of strategic communication that we've been trying to do to paint pictures of what you're seeing in Clover School District, what you're seeing at Clover High School. Uh, there's a construction story, what you've seen, what we saw this summer at um, Oak Ridge Middle School. Uh, there's also the story about uh, Mr. Love's finance, finances department and their success over a decade. Uh, you can see that on there. Um, and most recently, the bit about test scores, uh, how well our students did last year on SC Pass and SC Ready. So we're telling more and more of that information uh, and painting the picture of what's going on. Additionally, we're continuing to do Friday Facts. Uh, we, are, we are doing uh, Friday Facts in video format, format once a month, uh, and then email format uh, the remainder of the month. So uh, that'll be uh, what families can expect. We share that with them at the beginning of the year, uh, so you'll see that. We also do weekly communication within the district uh, so that our staff and employees can get in various bits of information that we share. Uh, we also are using Blackboard mass notification uh, to, to reach out to families, and that's where Friday Facts get sent, but we also use that at the beginning of the year for Dr. Quinn to share uh, a phone call with staff and parents as well. And that's how we are handling uh, a lot of the tech. You'll see then, uh, before I hand over to Ms. Knott, we're going to do media relations events as well. Um, I've myself have been on WRHI multiple times. I've uh, done some interviews with CN2. Uh, we did a story with uh, WCNC, WSOC TV, and WBTV. So there's been a lot of, uh, a lot of media coverage. Uh, we're also working on scheduling an event in October at Clover High School where we, 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 where we will have Mr. Ruth, and Mr. Largen and a number of students at Clover High School to share their experience of what they are seeing um, in, in the building. So uh, be on the lookout for that press release on the date and time for that. So that's our, our tech. Um, I'm gonna turn it over to Ms. Knott to share more of that personal interaction that we're having. Good evening. Um, as we shift gears to the high touch versus the high tech, we begin with community presentations. And um, we have a myriad of those coming up and thanks so many of our community organizations for hosting us in the days and weeks ahead. Um, we started meetings last week. Uh, they're continuing through this week and on up to the bond. But um, some of those groups um, are uh, civic groups, some are community groups, uh, some are churches, um, and some are organizations connected <coughs> to the school um, district itself so we thank them for giving us some time on their agendas and giving us the opportunity to speak to their membership additionally we've been doing tabling throughout the community um, some of you on the board have become my tabling friends in in recent days um, but we have been out at meet the teacher nights at um, some clover parks and rec events um, some that have happened already like a concert and some that are still coming up um, like trick-or-treat and some movie nights um, and food trucks on both ends. Um, we're at all the home football games, and we're also slated to be at the Rotary's Mummy Shuffle. So those are opportunities for us to um, encounter people as they're naturally gathering in our community for other events and giving us an opportunity to, again, um, put the bond election on their radars. Additionally, we're hosting parent town halls um, there is one of these events scheduled for each school. Um, some of these are standalone events um, where families are invited to come out for the purpose of discussing the bond. At other sites, they are being held in conjunction with something else. Um, one of the ones I think is most exciting um, is Clover Middle is um, offering uh, free admission to their athletic events if you come to the bond presentation first. Um, and um, used students to promote the event in a, in a video that they released on Friday. So um, that was that was nice. Yeah. I'll say this too. Lauren is doing a hot dog 
dinner night and the first thing on the agenda is the bond presentation as well so parents can come out and get that information before they get their other Title I family literacy stuff. So appreciate our schools really stepping up to host these events. We are also attending faculty meetings at all of the schools. There is one of these scheduled for each school and a few departments as well. Um, and these are also giving us um, an opportunity to review legal aspects of um, employee involvement in the bond campaign as well. It's just a chance to remind folks of what they are allowed to do or not do in their official capacity as a Clover School District employee. And then I am going to close with a little tease that has to do with signage. Um, these are in the mail, but shortly you will be seeing signs like these. Um, coming to a school facility near you. Um, I'm looking for those boxes every day when I come into the office. And um, with the culmination of everything, we say, whew, we've uh, been quite a ride so far. And um, still, um, how many days? 57. 57 days to go. So um, that is, is our overview, and we will welcome any questions that you might have. I have just a quick one. The, the letter that is going out, can you give an update on that from the board? Absolutely. The letter is at the printer. It has been printed. The envelopes are being printed tomorrow. So I'm thinking those will probably be out in the mail by the end of the week, I would guess. Mm -hmm. yes. Thank you. Sure. Mm -hmm. Any of the banners, update on the banners and the posters and all of those? There is a banner that will be delivered about the same time as those bond signs. I did not include it in the presentation, but there's one of those that we can use for those um, tabling opportunities or um, presentations. Um, there are signs that have been delivered to all of the schools as well um, for just promoting the date and um, the website to get more information about the election. So those are all at the schools now as well. And uh, we've also provided the schools with promotional materials um, to promote their parent night events. Mm -hmm. So they have had images that they could use in a principal's newsletter or a flyer that they could send separately and, and a poster to put up um, in the building as well. And once again, we'll be clear, it's all information based. Nothing that tells anyone how they should vote, just about the vote. That is correct. Thank you. And the electronic signs look great. I love the facts that are shown on the um, high school electronic sign for sure while I'm sitting in line up there. I, I read all of those. <laughs> and I have seen the bond vote um, advertised at the other signs as well. So that's great. Thank you for your work. Great job, you too. Thank you, board. Any other questions for Mr. Dillon or Ms. Knott? Just thank you for your hard work. They are a dynamic duo. I appreciate all that they're doing. Which one's Batman? <laughs> they have to fight over I'll, I'll, let, you, I'll let them decide that. <laughs> okay, so um, the next part of our board agenda is a set uh, that we have not had a lot of time to do board over the last year and a half as we've been working on our capital improvement plan, but we have a series of board policies that we need to take the board through. And then the way that we do that in Clover School District is the work session is a discussion period for the policy or the rule or the information that's the background information so that the board can hear it, digest it, ask questions, and then be ready at the first, at the next business meeting, which is the September business meeting for a first reading and then a second and final reading at the October business meeting. So board, I wanna encourage you tonight as you're going through discussions of these policies, your questions, your comments, we take notes on those so that when we bring the policy back to you at first reading, it reflects any changes that you're recommending for the, for the policy. So this is, of course, the night we want to encourage that. Our first policy up is the field trip policy. And uh, the field trip policy in and of itself has no major changes to it. However, we are proposing some revisions to the rule of the policy. And I don't think we had anyone on staff doing this one, so I'm gonna do this one before I invite our guests to talk a little bit about a field trip that we have coming up. But in the rule of the policy board, um, what we would like the rule to read is that the school principal must approve all field trips lasting one day or less. It used to say the school principal and superintendent must approve all field trips lasting one day or less. And because of the number of field trips, that is, uh, we believe that the principal should have the ability, if it's a day or less, 
to, to make those um, approvals in the building. The second paragraph says the superintendent, we want to add or designee, or my designee that works with field trips is Dr. Hopkins, but the superintendent or designee, and it said, it did say, and the board, but we would like to, to scratch that and say the superintendent or designee must approve all overnight field trips. We do believe all overnight field trips need another level of scrutiny. We do believe those need to come to the district office. They do currently come to the district office and they are approved by the superintendent at this point. And so we believe that is an appropriate step. We just would remove the board from that level. But we would add that the board and the superintendent will approve all field trips lasting more than three school days and any field trip out of the country. As, um, as a superintendent that needs to really make sure our community is aware of something that would cause students to miss school days, I think that is something that rises to the level of another level, level of discussion, especially if it's going to require a trip out of the country. So um, I would recommend those changes, and those are, the, I think, the major changes to that policy. Um, any other points of that that changed have to do with those major changes. So for example, in the middle and uh, towards the end of the policy, the principal will do the following approved field trips lasting one day or less. So that would take the superintendent out of that and just make it the principal. And then it would also submit to the superintendent on proper form any request for an overnight field trip. We already do that. And that require the board or the superintendent approval. And again, the board would be when it's out of the country in over three days. Do you have any questions, concerns, or any changes to make to that um, request? I have a question about, is there a requirement for students having to be academically qualified to attend overnight or extended field trips? Right now, we have not put in any criteria for academic approval. Um, let me look at the policy once again, just to be sure I'm not misspeaking it, it on that. Wait a minute. A student <laughs> must be in good standing at their respective school. Um, usually that is, in di that is discipline, um, i.e. not be suspended or expelled in order to participate in the activity. So good standing is a, usually a disciplinary. But isn't it also true that most of the groups sponsoring those trips have their own requirements in order to participate usually they do so you have to be in good standing with that group in terms of whatever the, the principal or the teacher excuse me not principal what the teacher would say with that group but if there's a recommendation Ms. Kerlick you'd like to make to tighten that up would you are you looking at maybe academic good standing yes because they're missing days of so school if you're missing that much school you should be passing all of your classes and uh, academic good standing and, I know I just got one and to today. add to, to Ms. Sherry's point I didn't see anything that discussed, not that this would hopefully ever happen, but if a child were to somehow misbehave on that trip, it, can something be added that they're held to the same requirements as if they were in class as far as behavior goes? Just because I didn't. Yes, I think that I'm looking to see if it already says that, but if it doesn't. I, I, I will, but I scanned it quickly. That. I may not have seen it. I'll make a note. Discipline on trip. Okay. Other recommendations for potential changes in this one? Okay. All right. Well, per policy, uh, the board will be approving or not approving a field trip that we have upcoming that does meet this criteria of out of the country and over three days of instruction. So I want to invite and thank Mr. Snyder, our new assistant principal. If you've not met Mr. Snyder, we're really happy to have him, as well as Mr. Langdell, our new band director, to come forward and give us a little more information and answer the board's questions about the trip. And congratulate you for being selected. Bands uh, of Clover for being you. selected. Um, I must admit, this is the first time I've ever been requested to come to a school board meeting. So. Uh, this is, so I'll get through this uh, with you guys together. So thank you so much for having me, um, Dr. Quinn, and members out here at the district office as well as the board. Um, so hopefully I'll be able to answer some questions. Um, they they have the information. They do. So yes, okay. So um, uh, so uh, and my student I just left rehearsal. They don't watch board meetings, I'm sure. 
Um, but if anyone is watching out there, so let's try to keep it a secret as much as possible. But uh, the um, St. Patrick's Day Committee in Dublin, Ireland, has extended an invitation um, and requested us to come and perform in the 2024 St. Patrick's Day Parade in Dublin, Ireland, which is really exciting. Um, it is a fantastic opportunity for our students, um, our community, um, our school. Um, this is uh, a very prestigious event. Um, parades are, are exciting to go to as a person. Um, they're even more exciting to go to as a band person. Um, and they're like life altering as, as a performer. Um, so when we have a chance to uh, have our students exposed in those kind of environments, um, it truly is uh, a once in a lifetime opportunity. Um, so we, um, you know, we were part of a rigorous, you know, uh, evaluation process and um, we received notification that we were selected. Um, it's, a, it's a rolling every two years kind of application. Um, Fort Mill High School is actually going this coming March in 2023. This is their second trip um, to go to um, Ireland to the parade. Um, uh, some colleagues of mine, uh, University of North Texas uh, just went this past uh, March. Um, but it's uh, an exciting adventure due to its um, distance. Uh, it is a little bit of a longer trip. Um, and due to the fact that it's St. Patrick's Day parade, they, they make the parade happen on the day of St. Patrick's Day. So in 2024, when we go, um, the parade is on Sunday. Um, and due to the distance travel, it would require um, what the travel company that we're using is proposing is to us to leave on a Monday, and then we would return on Monday. So we would be out of school six days. Um, if I did that math correctly, mm -hmm. yes. Uh, and so it is international travel, um, which is a fantastic opportunity for our students. Um, in the proposal that was presented to um, Mr. Ruth and Dr. Quinn, uh, it uh, outlines several educational um, experiences. One of the things that uh, <coughs> MTC Music Travel Consultants is who we're using to travel, and I've actually traveled with them before in my previous job. Um, they um, typically have outlined pretty standard things, uh, but when I um, when we got news that we were selected, I asked them to incorporate the um, trip to Northern Ireland to go to our sister city of Larne. Uh, and um, so that was a little bit different experience than what any, and actually none of the groups that have ever participated have done what we're gonna do. So we'll actually fly into Dublin on that Monday, um, and then we'll travel to Belfast. Uh, so the kids will actually get to go to both Ireland and Northern Ireland. Um, which is very exciting, which will be a great opportunity for teachers to discuss the difference. Um, and then we'll go to Belfast, spend some time in Belfast, which is where uh, the Titanic was built. So the students will get to go to the Titanic Museum. They'll get to go to the wharf where it was actually launched, which is very exciting. Um, they'll go to Hillsborough Castle, uh, as well as do a performance in the town square in the city of Barnes, which is very exciting. Um, and then they'll travel back to Dublin, and then we'll spend the rest of our time in Dublin. They'll experience uh, going and spending the day at a working Irish farm. Um, I'm personally very excited. I'm hoping to shear a sheep. I've never been able to do that. <laughs> um, there's not a lot of sheep on the, on the coast where I'm from, uh, but I'm very excited about that possibility. But they'll experience multiple different parts of, of agricultural life as well as um, city life uh, in Dublin. We'll get to go to um, different parts of uh, the city as far as museum as, museum as, well as art um, galleries and things like that as well. Um, so that's kind of an overview of, of that process. Of course, the parade is on that Sunday. Um, we will perform in downtown Dublin for the parade. Um, it is obviously a well-attended parade uh, in, in Ireland and internationally. And then we actually are going to pick up, a, we picked up a second parade uh, in a neighboring city, um, which is pretty exciting as well. So in the course of the week, we're going to perform in three different cities, two different countries, and, and be back in time for first period on Tuesday. So. <laughs> no promise. Yeah. Right. <laughs> I didn't say we'd be awake, but I said we would be there. I promise. Yeah, so um, I know that uh, there were a few questions that I'm prepared to kind of walk through, but I wanted to start with an overview um, initially. So do you want me to go ahead and start working through? Okay. So um, I, um, first and foremost, I'm originally from Walterboro, South Carolina. It's a small town where you stop, use the restroom on the way to the beach. 
uh, or to Savannah, but um, I grew up uh, in, a, in a very humble um, environment. I grew up on a farm. Um, we didn't have sheep though, so that's a bucket list item about the sheep. Um, but uh, so cost is always something I think about. My wife and I are both educators. Uh, so we all, I always think about, is this something that I could afford for my kid? Is this something that the, the average person in our community can afford? Um, the price is, is a little bit of a sticker shock. I will go ahead and say that to you. Um, uh, I think in the packet you'll notice that it ranges, I think around the student price is around $3,200, and that includes airfare. Um, they can't really like nail down our airfare cost until we get about 11 to 13 months out, uh, just because of the market and things like that. Um, another cost factor that causes that trip to be a little bit inflated is European hotels are smaller than American hotels. Typically, in an American hotel, we would put four kids to a room. So that helps us cut down on those costs. European hotels are small at best. Um, and so we're going to be looking at some of our hotels will be three to a room, and some of them will be two to a room. So that's why that cost is a little bit inflated um, for our typical trips. To give you some comparison, um, I've taken students uh, to Hawaii before. Chicago, New York. Um, I know that uh, here at Clover, my predecessor, Mr. Gulich, has taken groups to Hawaii. They were scheduled to go to Hawaii. I think that trip round was $2,600. Um, and that was, uh, you know, with most things included in airfare and things like that. So when you consider $2,600 for Hawaii and you have $3,200 for an international trip, that's pretty, pretty, pretty comparable and I, I think quite fair. Um, MTC, uh, it's a company out of Indianapolis, Music Travel Consultants. Um, my, I worked at Easley High School last year. We actually used them when we took the band to Grand Nationals in Indianapolis. Uh, they're fantastic, absolutely fantastic. They have great references. Um, they handle everything for us. They've also taken multiple groups to Ireland over the past several years, most recently this past March with the University of North Texas, substantially large band. Um, uh, one of the things that they really handle, and I, I talked to um, our rep uh, recently about this, um, from, the, from the moment that we announce, uh, their plan is to come and have a kickoff. I was hoping to announce this Saturday, which we're obviously going to work with that with, you know, pending approval or not. And, um, but then he's going to fly down, do a big presentation, walk the parents and the students through the options, which would be like our kickoff party. But they really handle everything. Um, all meals are included in that cost once they get on the bus to take us to the airport at Charlotte. Um, so meals are included, tax gratuities. The shipping, uh, the checking of their oversized bags, which will be the instruments, um, uh, all of the tips of gratuity when we're over there, anything that you see listed in that packet is covered in that cost. Um, so other than their souvenirs or if they need like a snack or something like that, all of that is included in that price. And um, as someone who travels quite a bit with groups, um, you can't, you wouldn't be able to do everything that we're doing for that price point. Um, and and be able to, to happen. So with the cost and the sticker shock in mind, you know, is this going to be affordable for the students that are in the program? Um, we have a relationship with uh, the Levy Company, which is at Bank of America's Panther Stadium. So they offer uh, groups, community groups, organizations. The Clover Band program has been working with them for quite some time. So we will run a concession stand. We actually run the largest I have not been to an event yet, but I'm looking forward to going to the Elton John concert very soon. <laughs> um, but uh, th we operate a very large stand, and so we do a profit share with the students and the parents. So uh, between August and December, just to give you a perspective, we, will, um, we, were, we are doing 15 events. And at every event, students, and we have uh, so many student workers and so many parent workers or you know, parent guardian <coughs> workers, they, we do a profit share where the boosters um, get so much credit and then the student gets credit put into their band account to go towards band fees, uh, trip fees, and things like that. So, um, you know, it, the profits share right now that we do, I think, Ms. Goff, please correct me if I'm wrong, it's $100, correct, I think, does that sound right? So if, if she and her husband work three events, they get $300 each towards their child's credit account. And then there's also incentives if there's a cold game or if you do three events, you get an additional bonus and things like that. So that is a huge uh, fundraising partnership we have with Bank of America. We do concerts, Panther games, and things like that, and that's for students and parents. Um, aunts and uncles can be a part of that too, so it doesn't have to be just you know, a mom and dad in there. So um, when I started this conversation, which I grew up on a farm, I'm first generation college grad, 
Um, my parents, I was musically inclined. It's hard to find the fine arts on the farm, I promised you that. Um, but I was musically inclined, and so my parents said, if you're gonna do this, you have to figure out a way to pay for it yourself. So I sold fruit, pecans, I mean, anything that we could. So my parents never paid for any of that, other than my instrument, they did pay for my trombone. Um, but, you know, I'm a firm believer that we're gonna find a way for the kids to get to Ireland. If, if, if they're making the effort, we're gonna try to figure out. So Bank of America, we also do other things, like we're doing a discount card fundraiser that we're working on right now. There's uh, several things that our percussion ensemble does around the holidays. Um, I also wanna launch a community-wide campaign where you can help, you know, maybe someone that's not necessarily connected to band, but they might be able to be willing to sponsor a kid to get to go. Uh, one thing I talked to the boosters about was trying to figure out a way as an organization we could cover either half or all of the airfare portion of the, of the cost for the students um, so that we can get them, get them there. So I'm a firm believer that, you know, if we go into this and with the belief that we're going to make it happen, we're going to make it happen for every kid that wants to be able to go regardless of their economic status. So cost was a point that I wanted to mention. Um, another thing as far as um, chaperones, um, I have a four-year-old, um, and she is, uh, uh, I'm very biased, but she's pretty awesome. But um, there's a very small list of people that get to watch her. Um, and we moved away from 95% of them when we <laughs> moved here this summer. So uh, I tell parents and I tell students um, that I treat every kid in my program as if they're my kid. And I said, so when we're part of this, your your last name is now Langdell, and you're part of my family. So I, I want them to know, and their parents to know that I'm going to take care of them like I would my own kid. So when when we travel, we travel, you know, in groups, small groups, and we travel with the utmost safety. You know, we talk through different things, you know, to be prepared for that. Um, recently, I was on a WebEx with some with my 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 former school. They're actually leaving to go to Charleston. Uh, for a weekend trip next week, and I said, you need to sit them down and talk through that this is not easily, you're going to a city. Kids, kids understand this is a city, this is people not, will not stop for you. You need to look where you're going, keep your wits about you. You know, and just, I, I know how to travel in a group, and I know how to travel, but I also know how to travel in a way that I want the students to feel safe and the parents to feel safe. So we'll travel in chaperone groups. The board policy says, I think it's, um, one to ten is what the board, uh, the district policy is for chaperones. Um, I typically, when, when I took my students to Hawaii at Eastleigh, we were in groups of four to six. Um, and typically, if it was six, I had two adults with them. And that's a mix of chaperone parents um, and staff. I don't really feel like we're going to have a hard time getting a lot of adults to go with us to Ireland. I just have that hunch. Um, but, you know, typically, I think when you're having small groups, four to six is good. We will travel, obviously, you know, in groups. But when we travel, I like to have the chaperones and the staff, they know everything that I know. So that if we ever get separated, they know where the next stop is. And that's something I learned um, whenever I started traveling with, with groups. Um, because there's no need to embargo any of that information. They need to be able to move their group. And if everyone has information, it's a lot easier. Um, one of the things that, uh, uh, that I wanted to mention as far as like health and safety, um, the Clover Band right now is 212 kids. Um, statistically, there's at least three runny noses right now in the program when I left a little while ago. Um, kids are going to get sick, you know, and things like that. My, my typical policy has been, and this is pre the last few years, is we always have one or two rooms additionally booked. And so in case a kid gets some type of virus, stomach bug or something like that, and, they, and they're sick, we will remove the kids that are not sick in their room and put them in one of those spare rooms that um, you know, so then the kid that is sick is in the room that they got sick in, and then the non-kid sick kids are in a different room. But that's what I've been doing for years. Um, a lot of travel companies do that anyway, just because statistically kids want to get, you know, food poisoning, something like that. You know, something's going to happen. They're kids, right? Or they just, you know, had Taco Bell and made a bad choice, you know, or something like that. Mm -hmm. um, so that's kind of uh, protocol as far as sickness goes. Uh, like I said, this is. Um, a great company out of Indianapolis. They've been traveling for quite some time. One of the things that he's going to do in his presentation to the parents and students is offer trip insurance. That's another thing is like what happens if I do get sick before I leave or something like that. Um, trip insurance is not covered in that cost that's listed, but they will have the option to do that. And that offers like a cancel for whatever reason. Um, we as an organization, as well as the school, have the ability to cancel uh, up to 45 days after the first payment. Of do, do so that gives us some leeway as a school 
Um, also, I think as long as we are within 60 days out, we will be able, students could um, back out and only lose partial of what they paid in. It just depends on where we are. Um, what I um, will have is whenever the parents fill out the information and they put together their first payment, it'll say this much paid up by this date. If you back out by this date, you get this much back. So they will lose their first deposit, but usually like once we get to that halfway point, you know, they could get most of their money back except for that. Um, you know, some of that once you get into the airfare and things like that, the closer we get, the harder it is. That's why I think the travel company goes 60 days out. Um, I think that's my hit list uh, that I had. So what questions? Yes, ma'am. I have a couple. First of all, I'd like to compliment your tie. It looks like you're already ready for your Well, <laughs> thank you. Thank you. I appreciate that. Um, so will you also go ahead and give this information to eighth graders since they would be eligible to go? Yes. I'm glad you mentioned that. So I fully want to use this as a tool to help kids come into the program. So yes, when, we, when I took my students to Hawaii, um, at Easley, we did that where we actually would look. We, we reached out to the kids that would be with us. So that would be, and we already have some what we call early markers that, that are in our program and same thing with like percussion and things like that. So that's kind of, that, that process is already kind of in, in our culture. Um, so we definitely could reach out to the parents and have like a meeting at Clover Middle and Oak Ridge Middle <coughs> at one of their events and just say, hey, we're gonna walk you through this. So if you already know your kid's gonna be a part of the, the high school band program, this is just something so you're aware so your kid doesn't miss out on this opportunity. Did Absolutely. Did I hear you correctly said 212 students? Yes, sir. I just, we had rehearsal, I scooted out. It's hard to teach in that tower when you're wearing sure. a tie. But um, it's, uh, I have 212 students right now in the, in the March of okay. Do you ex expect any well, like extra expense as far as you're gonna get new uniforms or flags or well, we just got new uniforms last year, and they're okay. fantastic. Um, thank you so much. Uh, and um, we, you know, we have in our annual operation budget, you know, as far as things that we need, like that's normal operations and things like that. Is that what you're referring to, or just specifically for this? Trip? I was just curious if, if this parade required you to, like, for example, wear the color green, or um, I was just curious. You no, know, most, most schools will do something subtle and things like that. You know, what we would probably look at um, is maybe doing uh, something, we have plumes in our, in our yes, shakos, like we may look into doing something with the plumes. It's possible depending on the weather because Europe, European weather is very unpredictable. We may look at doing something um, like scarf or something like that that may show clover but also may have some colors that we could show, maybe something with Larn or Car Ireland, things like that. I don't foresee any like mm. large, you know, costs as far as any additional stuff. Um, Full disclosure, you know, the biggest thing that I would have as a director that would concern would be as far as getting our instruments over there. But MTC have, has already, you know, put that into the price of this. Yeah. So, like, anything larger than um, a, a saxophone is probably going to have to be checked as an oversized bag. Um, so trombones, baritones, tubas, percussion, all of that would be an oversized bag, and those, those get a little pricey. But they've already incorporated that into the price. Thank because you. And that was the question I had. On here, I know when you said earlier, the oversized bags, mm -hmm. but this on here says excluded in the oversized bags. Correct, and I asked that same question okay. to uh, our, our rep. And so I think that that's a generic policy that they keep in all of theirs. Um, but, and this was, I, I knew that we were under a time crunch as far as the sequence of, of y'all's meetings that were coming up. So um, there, I have not signed, you know, I have not signed that. And so there's a few things like that, but he, um, if you're going on as like a, you have two packets, one of them says the fan, fan package, so that's a little bit different. If you're traveling as a student, you, that's gonna be covered. But if you're going as a mom or a dad and you're just taking a lot of clothing options, your second oversized bag may not be covered in the cost. I think that's why that's there. But I would like to chaperone, but I'll have an oversized bag. Uh, so you need to work on that. <laughs> but, um, I think he also, he mentioned to me, it may not be in your packet, is uh, international travel typically doesn't charge you for the first bag they charge you for the second bag, and if it's over, I think it's 50 pounds, so. And passports, you will help. Um, Correct, so um, we talked a little bit, um, I talked to a few of my boosters about that. Um, I actually am out of the window where mine has to be renewed, so I'm working on that right now. So I'm going through the process, so I'll be able to walk them through. I'm hoping that when I go for my renewal that I'll be able to um, convince someone that maybe they could come and do it on site and we could do it like in a bulk thing because now you have to do interviews 
rather than just dropping off your stuff like you used to. Um, but and parents will have to be involved because if you're under if you're a minor, um, the parents have a, a step in that piece that's different from an adult. Do, do you know if this is I know this is pretty far off, but do you know if this event's going to be streamed? Uh, they do stream it, um, and there are several, and you could look up Fort Mill's performance, uh, the one that they did last, which was from a few years ago, um, and uh, it's pretty awesome. You can look at UNT's. Um, there's a lot of, like, not great resolution versions of some of those, but there are some that are streamed. I just didn't know if there was a way you could possibly set up where you could charge for that and maybe offset some of your cost. That would be great. I'm sure Brian Dillon would love to go with us. Maybe we could work out some type <laughs> of an agreement where he could stream it and, you know, we could do like a pay-per-view. We awesome. might be fighting over which one of us goes. Uh, listen, <laughs> listen, <laughs> I've already, Mr. Reed already told me that he's head chaperone, and I said, I'm perfectly fine with that. <laughs> perfectly fine with that. Um, but it's, it is a, you know, traveling is, is, a, is a wonderful experience. You guys were talking about field trips. I think sometimes in field trips, we think that it's just like, oh, kids getting out of school. I like to think of it because of what, I like to think of it as kind of like, you know, the magic school bus, you're literally taking a classroom on wheels and you're, you're, you're moving the classroom. And from a discipline standpoint, you guys mentioned that as well, but also from an expectation standpoint, it, whatever happens on that experience, it's as if it happened in my classroom and we want the students to have, and this is not just a chance for us to go and, and walk down the street and play our instruments because we could do that here, you know, but this is a chance for, um, you know, band, band provided opportunities that I would have never had. And I think that it's, it's important for me as a teacher to make sure that my students get to have, you know, world class experiences and, and perform in, in the best venues and the best places, you know, and, and because they're in a time of their life where they can do stuff like that and they, never, they may never get a chance to do that again, which is pretty exciting. And the seniors that we have this year, I talked a little bit to our travel consultant about this, and depending on how we work through it, and I talked to Mr. Ruth a little bit, we have to figure out how, what the implications are from, from a school standpoint. I would love to be able to offer the seniors that graduate this year to go with us as well, in some way, shape, or form as well, so, because they would be already out of school. So we'd have to figure out what the rules and, and statutes as far as that goes, but give them at least the opportunity to go as like a fan or as a tag along or something like that, because I think it's a great, a great experience. And I know there are several meetings when you go on an overnight field trip mm -hmm. and have kids, you know, in school. And um, being someone who, I'm a type 1 diabetic myself, mm -hmm. you know, traveling out of the country is a big, big deal for someone with um, any medical issue. So I'm sure you're going to mm -hmm. have meetings and meetings Correct. and meetings with parents and explain how to handle situations like that that maybe mm -hmm. have not We have monthly country. booster meetings anyway for our organization. And so what I've typically done is have, much like you guys, We'll have like our normal meeting, but then we'll have, we don't call it work sessions, but like we'll have a trip session meeting where it's like, we gotta have this because you have to have this done by certain dates. Um, and we talk through about, you know, TSA guidelines. And obviously this is a little bit different piece um, because of the international factor. Um, but, uh, you know, we have plenty of time because I think we're almost, uh, almost a year and a half out. So we have plenty of time, you know, you can expedite a passport and get it in five weeks at this point. You know, obviously that's a little bit more pricier than usual. But, um, you know, we can work through all of those pieces. And, you know, the TSA guidelines today are very different than they were a year ago this time. So, you know, we'll, we'll keep an eye on that. MTC is really good about kind of walking through what to expect with some of that as well. Um, so I think we can, we can keep on. But that's a good point as far as the diabetic uh, and, and medicines and things like that. Yeah, I almost didn't get in the Capitol building. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> they were like, no, I don't know if you can come in. <laughs> yeah. My, my, my brother-in-law, <laughs> he, uh, he lost, he, he and his wife, um, she has dual citizenship in France and here. So they were traveling in Europe, and um, he uh, he lost his insulin. So he ended up having to get it in Spain. That was the closest place he could get his version. So, so it was an interesting story. What other questions? I appreciated your comments about making sure that every student who wants to go is able to go. So um, being able to, to afford that is, mm -hmm. is welcome um, welcome news to them, I'm sure. Mm -hmm. I noticed that there are some complimentary um, trips that are included as mm -hmm. part of the package, part of the contract package. Will you be able to use any of that to scholarship students? That's a great point. So typically, they have MTC has a formula where if you say your band is 100 kids, you get this many comps, if your band is this many. So with us telling them what our current size of the band, they're anticipating that many comps. Most of the time that's going to be covering essential personnel, staff, or things like that would be needed. Um, you know, so the, being able to take some of those comps and apply it to 
some of it maybe have to go or also scholarships, that is definitely an option because essentially they're, they're, they're allowing a chunk of, of money that they're willing to write off essentially for some of that. Um, you know, but that is a great option. I'm hoping, um, one of my really good friends in Tennessee, Kingsport, Tennessee, they, they, um, bless you, uh, they took their band to the Rose Parade years ago, and their band is, is massive. It's, um, two, their competitive band is about 250, and I think their, their full band is about 300 and 350. Um, and so, but they went to Rose Parade, and they actually very similarly set it up to where if, a kid, bless you, if they had a kid that wanted to go, they made it, to, made it happen. And so I, I've talked to him a little bit about stuff. They had a couple of community galas where, you know, someone could donate. You know, like, I want to provide an opportunity for a kid, and then we would have, like, an application process and, you know, express some type of a need or something like that. But um, typically, with, it, with and I've worked in, in some settings where it's been higher SES and lower SES than where we are right here in, in Clover and Lake Wiley. Um, typically, when it comes to trips, um, especially if you have enough notice, because you have multiple birthdays, you know, you've got holidays where you could say, instead of giving little Johnny a Christmas gift or some type of holiday gift, you can offer to help pay some of that trip and things like that, in addition to the fundraising opportunities we have over the next uh, couple of years. And I'm also gonna try to be strategic with some of our band fees so we're not, we're not you know, so we can offset some of that so that, you know, they're not having to pay premiums on both sides, so. Thank you. What other questions? Looks like all the questions. Thank you for being so prepared and for all the good information. And we will have it on the board agenda for the September meeting board for you to approve or not approve. Okay. Thank you very much all for right. your time tonight. Thank you so much. Enjoy your night. Thanks for being here. If you're welcome to stay for the rest of the night or uh, if you're ready to go home after a long day, you can do that as well. All right. <laughs> <laughs> I had a feeling you'd say that. All right, next up, um, our, we have a couple of instructional policies. I'm going to ask Dr. Dickey and Ms. Goff and possibly Ms. Dunder. At some point, all three of those ladies are going to be a part of the presentation. We're going to start off with the proficiency-based credit policy. This is policy IHC. It is a new policy. That's why you see model beside it. It, it just was issued from the School Boards Association because we do have a proficiency application in Clover. Uh, we have to have a policy that goes along with that. So Dr. Dickey, if you'll explain to the board what they need to know. Good evening, Dr. Quinn and members of the board. So as Dr. Quinn aforementioned, um, this is to ask for your review of a model policy for proficiency-based courses within our district. And so uh, back in the spring of this year, we did submit a revision or I guess a, a new um, update to our district proficiency based plan that was already on file. Uh, it is filed with our state department along with our strategic plan. And um, the purpose of really having a proficiency based plan is that we recognize the need that there are several factors that we want to use proficiency based to help and that is continuing to decrease our dropout rate, improving our graduation rate, uh, addressing the decline of students who may leave our school because of going to home school or another proficiency based or online program and then just also for families that desire some sort of flexible scheduling. Uh, we allow proficiency based for our students at Clover High School and our tri-district adult ed and to just kind of give you a number or perspective of how many students this impacts. At Clover High School we have 450 students who do either initial credit, uh, content recovery, or credit recovery through some sort of means of proficiency. And we use Edmentum uh, as a vendor to do that, but we also have students who take initial credit through Virtual SC, as well as USC Union and York Technical College. And so again, that's about 450 students at our high school. But just so you know, so basically anyone at our high school would be eligible to do that if they chose to do it through initial credit. Uh, within adult ed and tri-district, uh, right now over the course of the, um, being of the three districts, there are uh, three students there who are working toward their high school diploma and they are doing it in a proficiency model. So that's just kind of to give you, a, hopefully uh, that would be something they would be able to increase in that program. So that gives you an idea of the number that we have available. 
Uh, just a, a few facts. Again, we use Edmentum. Uh, if a student, it's a possibility for initial credit. It's also for credit recovery. Uh, but we also have op options where uh, we can do modules in Edmentum that if a student needs to do content recovery, that if there's a particular module or unit that they didn't pass, they can use Edmentum for that. Uh, as well as within our flexible model at the high school, if there are students who maybe didn't do so well on a particular area, uh, they can do some content recovery through teacher-created modules that also exist. Um, in thinking of this, uh, when you look at credit recovery, if a student fails a course with a 50 to a 59, they are automatically the next semester or the next term uh, enrolled in some sort of credit recovery to at least get them to a passing score of a 60 for that. <coughs> we offer online uh, proficiency-based programs. There has to be a certified teacher of record uh, for those, so we have teachers uh, within our staff and they were listed within your packet uh, who are the content area teachers that are listed as the teacher of record. But there is also a lab proctor who is there to assist students in completing their work when they are using that uh, lab um, basis there. Also in your package, you can see uh, the documentation that is given to students uh, that kind of tells them the parameters if they need credit recovery. Uh, again, for those students who uh, failed a course between a 50 or a 59, uh, there are uh, procedures if it's content recovery uh, through um, maybe a teacher-created module or a module that's online if you need to recover. It tells the student what they can do with that. And then as well as initial credit if a student chooses to apply for that if there is a scheduling conflict. Um, where they need to actually take a class online. For example, maybe if it, they want to take an extra course and it conflicts with their current schedule and they can't work around it, um, then they are allowed to do so through an online application. Uh, but when students meet with their counselor to plan their IGP in terms of initial credit, they can let them know the possibilities, the options of taking that, uh, as well as this periodic check-ins with the student if there is a need for credit recovery or content recovery with the teacher. Are there any other questions or things my dad can uh, help with? We, we're using content recovery before they fail the class, while yes. they're still in the class. While they're still Credit recovery is, is after they have failed with a 50 or 59. Between 50 to 59, yes, sir. Yes, sir. Do we have, um, does that apply to 12th graders as well, the 50 to 59 standard? Yes, sir, it does. Okay, and is there a number of courses I guess what I'm asking is, is there a cap to the number of courses that a child can use credit recovery for? So, okay. Thank you, ma'am. Any other questions for the board? All right, as this is a new policy, it'll, 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 it will get a new an, an issue date uh, as soon as the board approves it in October. The good thing is we've had the application the policy is a new requirement. So we will keep our application and now we will have a board policy that governs it. All right, the next one is uh, acceptable use of technology. This is not a new policy. This is one we have had for quite some time, but Ms. Goff has done a great job updating it. As we have grown in our technology use, there's been some needed changes. So Ms. Goff, if you would walk us through the changes. Uh, we'll certainly do that. Um, so just to be clear, we are, since there's a stack of policies, we are looking at policy IJNDB, acceptable use of technology, and the accompanying rule and forms. So it's a little stop, but I'm gonna be quick. Um, the majority of the strike through and or additions are just to bring this policy up to date. It was initially, uh, not initially, but updated and reissued in 2014, which is before we went one-to-one. -one. So there are a lot of things that are just time stamped here. Um, and so there are things that are no longer a struggle for us and there are new things that are that need to be addressed in policy or the rule to um, compensate for that time. Um, so you'll see a lots of strike throughs and movement, but again, it's just for it to bring it into the future and to leave it in a place where it cannot be touched for another seven years because we've been very inclusive with the language in terms of broadening terms. Um, so, um, the policy itself is rewritten to match a model policy. So it's mostly strike through 
Um, and the new pieces are in um, green for me, red for you. Um, but like I said, it's, ball, it's from a model policy that's very inclusive to say we have to use our um, technology appropriately. More details are found in the accompanying rule. Um, the first big change there is in the section titled acceptable use agreements. And so we had a process to find there that we no longer follow. Um, we lean more heavily now on teaching digital citizenship and responsibility across time. So it's not certain dates and times at the beginning of the school year. It's more thorough. Um, and it doesn't, it doesn't have the level of restriction that says we will control your every access. We gave them one-to-one -one devices. So we can't say what we said. So that acceptable use piece is just saying you do sign a form every year um, and then we are promising to teach you about the things that you're saying you agree to. And we do that. Um, in this section entitled guidelines um, or general digital technology and online access, the last couple of bullets are new there. Um, we have a lot more focus on um, information security and privacy of that personal information. Um, and so we've added a couple of bullets there to protect um, ourselves from some of those things. It's also a more prevalent source of issue. Um, so we wanted it called out specifically in the policy. There is a new section, I'm on the third page for me, called Electronic Materials Assigned to Students. That is a brand new section because most of the materials that we are now reviewing and adopting are digital. And so we needed to call that out in, in policy. Um, so it's t it also talks about the SIPA compliance piece because every piece of anything that we use has to be looked at under that lens. Um, also, it references another board policy about challenging materials. Um, also, later in that page, it talks about the personal use of social media. There is a section that talks specifically about Facebook that has been replaced by the word social media in a more broad term of how we use that. Um, and we are advising that staff use the adopted platforms of the district rather than creating accounts and using things outside of that. It's for their protection as much as it is ours. Um, not relying on group text that you create with a, a teacher creates with their personal device. We're using the systems we have in place for communication, be that Blackboard, be that Canvas, be that whatever apps we've adopted. Um, for instance, one of the gentlemen that spoke tonight Mr. Langdale, they use the band app, but it's a very protected place where you can get information in a variety of different forms to get directly to people's cell phones without a personal number being shared. In the, real quick, I, yeah. I, I had asked Tony this earlier, um, and he clarified it a little bit, but I just wanted to clarify in case anyone reads it, but in the section of off-campus conduct, um, where you've added school use school issued devices, um, you're saying you, no inappropriate use of the internet on your personal device or on school issued devices? Correct. Correct. Okay. No matter where you are, we want you using technology appropriately. Um, and we said the appropriate use of the internet or web based resources is the one that crossed it out, but we wanted to call out not just the internet use, but everything that they know on the device that we've given them. Right. I'll just add on are. that one. Um, that key phrase for that, Ms. Cody, is if your use of social media on a device, whether it's school issued or not, substantially interferes or disrupts the school, then there could be a disciplinary consequence. Right. And that's the key. And there's, that's been adjudicated fairly recently mm -hmm. and has been upheld. Um, and it's also, there's a piece in the Code of Conduct, um, and there's a one about personal use of devices. There, you're reviewing one for staff, but there's also one for students in the student section. So it, that same phrase is used in multiple policies. Ms. Carl, yeah. uh, you have a section that says the documented inappropriate use will result in the cancellation or restriction of internet privileges. In today's world, and with most teachers now using the internet for their lessons, digital, et cetera, whatever, uh, is there, what do we do when a child loses their privileges 
but every class they go to requires internet access? It becomes very, very cumbersome, and okay. Mr. Hoffman can tell you that we have to make it happen. Okay, so we just make <laughs> hard copies? Yeah. Because I, I heard somebody say one time, it's, you know, in today's world, taking away the internet is almost like taking away a child's pencil. You know, you wouldn't take away their pencil, so. Correct. But um, so all there, we have it just seems like it's means a, to do things. Um, we yes, have offline th means, and we have right. things that are, so they're still digital, but they're offline, and we also have paper-based. Right. And well, there and have see, been instances we have done it. Yes, ma'am. My, my concern is, being an educator, is that that's a lot of work for the teacher. And yes, I just didn't know if there was a, an option to, if an if a iPad or a, a MacBook could be programmed to only open this one site. We so absolutely have that level of can. restriction available, okay. and we use that frequently. Yes, ma'am. So we can exclude sites. You can not You can go anywhere except here, or you can either go only here. So we have different variations of restriction across devices right. in the district, both MacBooks and iPads. Yes, ma'am. And this may be going down a rabbit hole real quick, and I, I won't be long, but when I was doing iSchool, I had the option to see what every child was doing on their 30 different screens. I know that would probably be a huge bear to try to do for every teacher's classroom. But we actually can. Oh, can we? Do. Oh, okay. So it's gotten even more advanced since I was doing Okay. Well, thank Absolutely. you. Absolutely. Um, it's part of the Apple Classroom piece. So in being in the Apple ecosystem, I know it's expensive, but we made the decision for a lot of the right reasons. And okay. sometimes that costs extra, right? Um, but in Apple Classroom, a, a teacher can see all of the devices in her classroom. Um, it is a huge network hog in terms of that's, bandwidth yes, that's and that's what that I was concerned thing. about. So we would prefer that that not be where they are. And we also talk about how it's not a gotcha. Sure. And um, originally when we talked, and um, Matt, correct me if I'm wrong, but the um, words were called FOCUS when it was originally a part of our management system, JAMP. It was FOCUS before it was Apple Classroom. Yes. And FOCUS is made, and Apple Classroom does this too, so that you can, as a teacher, say all the devices in this classroom can only go to this app or to this web page or to whatever. So you can use the tools within Apple Classroom, whether you see and are looking live stream in those. Yes, ma'am. You can restrict or focus students into the instructional so piece if you want. We're doing everything we can to try to prevent unauthorized access to We sure are trying. Yes, ma'am. I understand. Thank you. You're welcome. Um, also, I'll say an in instructional, because that's just who I am, Apple Classroom gives us some opportunities, because now that I can see everybody's device, I can go, Dr. Hemingway's example of how he did this particular literary device or how he did this particular math equation is exemplary and throw it to my board immediately. So you have the ability to pull content from the student devices in a streamlined way. So it has lots of instructional opportunities. Not just a gotcha tool. Um, we changed some things about reporting, and um, again, it was just to be more consistent with practice. We're still following all the laws and regulations that apply. It still matches the code of conduct, but we had some practices called out that we didn't do the way they were called out, so we've tried to, to update that language. And that brings me to the end of that. So that's that administrative rule. There are two forms that come with it, one for students and one for um, staff. The student one, the only change is there is a duplicated unauthorized in number three. So that is the only change to the student pledge. Yay! Um, and then the second file there is an employee assurances. It is updated to um, match the administrative rule because some of the language there was now out of sync with what was in the rule, so it's been updated. Um, where it says web page authorizing, uh, authoring, we do not do that anymore. Um, while we can, teachers do not necessarily build out a web page. They use a Canvas course. They use some other platform. And so we just wanted to talk about the online content <coughs> that they might provide and give them some, some um, guidance there. So it, it's, again, a broadening of the term so that it can live forever. Other questions, those were great. The policy or the rule or the form? No. Thank, Thank you, you. Ms. Goff. Good job. <laughs> 
And I don't know if you're staying for the next one or if Dr. Dickey's coming forward, but the next one is also a technology policy, but this is about how we select resources for the device and how we adopt resources on the device. So this is policy IJKA. And so I don't think it has a role. Good evening again. Uh, Dr. Quinn, we realized that the, what was in the board's packet was not the uh, marked up version. So we are giving out the marked up version now so they can see the particular edit um, that we are, are asking for consideration in that policy. Thank you very much. Um, so um, just to, we've got the presentation um, for, on epic proportions. There we go. Thank you. Uh, to go along with it. So um, for members of the board, we do take very, very seriously the selection of instructional materials for our students, and it requires truly a deep and ongoing evaluation of what we do and what's available. And so we want to talk to you a little bit tonight about that policy, IJKA, particularly in a world where we now have some third-party applications that go along with things that we use supplementally. So uh, just we'd like to kind of get started a little bit with just sharing some statistics in regard to the use of a third party app and then we'll hopefully we can circle back to discussion on the policy if that's okay. I'm gonna make magic happen here. So I want to talk a little bit about why reading matters especially in the elementary level. So I'm going to give you some statistics. We were going to quiz you, but we decided it wasn't that kind of work session. I do, want to <laughs> <laughs> I do want to call out that students who have strong reading skills in the third grade are four times more likely to graduate high school. They're going to be successful in their future. They're three times more likely to attend college. And I, college is loosely defined there. It's going beyond high school. Some statistics that have negative pieces to them, but to me actually give us a positive. If you look at um, the statistic on poverty, 4% of those in poverty have strong literacy skills. Yet, those who live in po poverty, 43% of them were struggling readers. In our, um, in our prisons, in our detention centers, 60% of inmates have literacy skill issues. <laughs> They're struggling readers when they were younger, and they never developed the skills. 85% um, of our juvenile offenders fall into that category as well. The last statistic here is a positive one. 25 books in your home as a child means you're gonna go two more years in school, whatever that means for you. So access to books is highly important. Thank you, Dolly Parton, for your efforts. <laughs> now we've got to do some things on our own. 50% more words are found in books than what students would have in, book, in um, television, radio, not that they listen to radio so much anymore. Um, and the daily conversations, even daily conversations with adults. And 20 minutes of reading each day exposes children to 1.8 million words in a year. If you look at those statistics in terms of students who are performing or not early in their education, so if they are, how they are performing on benchmarks and state assessments in the third and sixth grade, if you look down those statistics for a minute, you will see that students who are reading more, that magical 20, are achieving at higher rates. They're reading more books, therefore they're being exposed to more words. They're developing that vocabulary, they're developing fluency in reading, they're developing their comprehension skills, and they're achieving at higher levels. If you look at the difference between students, both in the third and sixth grade, who aren't achieving and those who are, the difference is six minutes. Six minutes of reading a day. So in looking at our board policy, we already have two policies that help us determine and look at the resources that we use as supplementary materials. Excuse me. So first of all, we do have policy IJK uh, that talks about the adoption of those materials 
and uh, we talk about materials that we want to uh, enhance students' uh, knowledge acquisition and self-cultivation, but we also want to make sure that in looking at that, we are careful that we avoid uh, materials that contribute to uh, sexual or ethnic or racial or religious bias or stereotypes. And then we also have our policy IHA, which is our basic instructional policy uh, that talks about what we want our students to be able to do, that we want them to be intellectually curious, we want them to be critical thinkers and problem solvers, and we want them to have aesthetic appreciation. And all of those things are we are able to provide for students as we help them with materials and resources. So, but as we continue on tonight, we want to unpack a little bit in terms of the infographic we shared earlier uh, and just talking about uh, what we're looking at when we provide resources that come from some third party uh, applications. So we're going to unpack that a little bit tonight. Um, you all probably know when you look at our budget that we spend a significant amount of our instructional budget on things such as Fountas and Pinnell and iReady that measure students' fluency and comprehension. And so once you measure that, in order to help them grow and advance, you have to have the appropriate resources so they get the right amount of practice, so they become better readers in terms of fluency and in terms of their comprehension. So um, we recognize that it's great when you have a print library, but when you are really able to give students access in real time to other resources that, you know, um, you may like books on a particular type of flower, or you may like books um, about flags or that sort of thing. Uh, but if I don't have that book right there in my classroom, and that's what you want to read about, or that's what you want to practice with, it's great to have some of those online things in order for students to be able to access and be able to not only just find that book that talks about it, but a book that's on their particular level so they get to practice with it. We say that we value an individualized and personally relevant education. So now we have to take some action on that. Providing our students access to titles that are on their level and with their interests allows us to do that individualization and personalization. Um, it allows them to have a topic for research that's not the one that the librarian bought 10 years ago. Like we can literally move and groove with what the students want to research. And the things they're searching for are totally appropriate school topics. It's just that we didn't have the foresight to order those before. And now they've called on them and you have access. So when you look at our um, English language arts standards, and what we have there is just a snippet to allow you to see how it builds from kindergarten through fifth grade. It's not just important <coughs> that students are able to read text but they also have to be able to write and generate their own informational and narrative text. And so um, some of you grew up when I did, and you looked to encyclopedia for knowledge, but <laughs> as we know, sometimes things that are in print, they become obsolete very quickly. But if you have access to online uh, resources, those become up to date, and they allow students to have access to information uh, that is current and relevant and it allows them to have resources so that when it comes time that they have to generate something that's an informational text, they are able to create and substantiate their own arguments and opinions around particular topics. And so having those online resources allows them to have content that they can research that is current and is relevant. When children are excited about what they're reading, they are more likely to read more pages. And they're more likely to do that for the same periods of time, both of which translate into increased proficiency as readers. And we can go back to that first slide of statistics, and if we can help them develop this love of reading, it's going to develop their propensity to learn. And so in looking at uh, access to a vast online collection, it helps to expand a teacher's classroom library. Um, it's wonderful when teachers can have a vast type of titles within their classroom library, but if you think about maybe teachers who haven't been in the profession as long, 
who are continuing to build their libraries, or as well as when you want to have content that is relevant for maybe the teacher who's been there for a while and their um, classroom library is a little more aged, it allows students to have that access to various uh, reading levels and countless topics without necessarily spending the money. And as well, uh, when you look about the content within uh, Epic in particularly, they have titles that are from some trusted resources like your National, National Geographic, your Macmillan, and your Harper Collins. We would be providing instant access to image-rich content on personalized topics, which means we can let them pursue their passion in ways that meet our standards and the things that we want them to be in the profile of a South Carolina graduate, which circles back to that personalized and individualized education that we said we value. In this era, when you have access to unlimited titles, uh, you allow students to avoid maybe having to go to the library within the school building and wait for a title that's on a waiting list because it's already checked out by a classmate or even within their own, the student's own classroom uh, library if the teacher only has one copy of a particular title. Having access online allows them to check out things uh, that are quickly, um, quickly in that manner. But also if a particular grade level or class is doing a project on a particular topic, and you need multiple copies of one book, having that online access allows you that if you have 10 children who need one book, all 10 of them can have it when they need it and they don't have to wait. Uh, or even if it's something maybe that's just supplemental and they want to read, you know, if you're interested in finding more about, say, for example, England or the United Kingdom this week, you want to read Ireland. about it this or Ireland if you're the band student. You want to read about it now. You may not necessarily want to wait three weeks until uh, Ms. Goff is finished reading the book and then I can check it out. And, excuse me, and this will help us as far as having, for example, classroom sets of books. Teachers won't have to purchase 20 copies of a book at $8 a piece. And okay. That's exactly right, yes, sir. If, um, if a teacher wanted to do a small reading group or a literature circle on a particular book, they would have them all there right there on the student's device. Epic has a large selection of read aloud text. I said earlier that we have Apple for some reasons. One of them is accessibility. And so anything that's on the iPad can be read aloud. Like we can use those native accessibility features. And I'm getting ready to release, I um, was talking to Mr. Dillon today about releasing some accessibility shorts to engage our students and staff and community in learning how to use those accessibility features. Epic provides rich read alouds where it's an animated graphic and highlighted words. So that is really going to reach our students that are struggling with reading, be that for a variety of reasons. It's going to be very engaging for our multi-language learners. Um, so it has those kinds of features already built into a lot of titles. Last, never least, is maybe. <laughs> okay. Teachers and students can, can build collections to support either a topic that they're researching together for a project, or if there are pathways where we all are learning about something in a different way, our teachers and our students have been building those with EPIC. And so some of them are a little sad that they have begun the school year without some of those pathways that they have developed. Um, so I love it because our kids have taken ownership and are building collections of books on topics. And so that's creativity at its best, which drives me and it's personalized learning. And then I won't read for you, but um, our teachers have spoken about how much they enjoy using Epic. And so in just to kind of review, we spoke about the variety of texts, but also, as you mentioned, if you want to have a group discussion or discourse on a particular topic and you need that resource or content, it allows every child to have access to that book if you need it. Uh, it's also allowing students to have access to some diverse titles that maybe if our library collection is a little aged, it may not have. And 
and then students just really love it. They love seeing the texts that are there, and they also love having the access to videos and uh, content on particular topics. I also am not going to read this quote to you, um, but it is from one of our elementary media specialists, specifically one of our Title I media specialists. Um, I shared a statistic earlier about books in the home and the difference that they can make. Um, a Title I school has some homes that need a little help having access to those resources. And so this media specialist is saying it's a lifesaver in that respect because it gives access to students who can't afford to go get access. Yes, I realize there's a public library, but this is super simple. It's in the place where they've been doing all of their other learning. Um, she talks about how it engages reluctant readers. Um, she talks about access for those who are less advantaged. If we look at this, Mike has a question. Yeah. Speaking of the low-income students, I was just curious: Does the Epic app have a way to store materials that they can download at school and then read at home? Or what about for our students that don't have? I got a nod. So they they could download a book at school and be able to access it, even if they may not have internet at home. Yes, sir. There's a read offline option. Okay. That, that's okay. Thank you, ma'am. Um, so, our average elementary school library has 10,000 titles. Some have a few more, some have a few less. That is not necessarily strictly based on school size. So, Crowder's, while it's larger, has a larger collection, it's not 10,000 and 10,000 from the two sides that made one. So, it, they aren't necessarily equal. So, you can look and you see the number of titles per student. I've broken it down there. Um, schools are not labeled by who is who, but the row is a particular school. So you can see the average of titles available per student ranges from 17 to 25. So um, some of our smaller schools have not as many access. They have a smaller collection and they have a, a population that matches another school. So you can see what that looks like there. Um, the average age of our collection for the district is 2007, so that is considered aged. So quick math, we're 15 years from now <laughs> behind. Um, there is a document, a collections document about that media specialists have about this, how you know how to rate their collection and that kind of thing. Um, so the aged is considered 13 years or older. So um, from the copyright date. So you can see the percentage there for our various library collections with the average being 40% aged. So, okay. so we do recognize that having access to titles on a third party app, it does allow for a lot of variety and diversity. But we also recognize that there are some instances where having that diversity or that access may not necessarily align with a family's preferences within our community. And so uh, that is part within our board policy that we have where uh, we want to talk about with you all if you wish to consider having some sort of either opt out or opt in uh, provision in terms of students with access to that. And so, um, as well as doing that, one of the things that we did do is start to look at trying to draft a form um, that we would provide in our schools um, where families could have that option based on what the board's desires are. And so, um, it's a little small on the slide, <laughs> but um, it's just a draft and a Google form that um, your parents could choose. Do you have a copy of that that we can? I can totally send you. Okay. Yep. What does it cover, basically, Beth? Um, it's asking who you are and do you want to opt out. And the only app listed at this time is Epic. So if, if other things came, which is a part of the policy that's up for thing, if other things became something that had the opportunity for access that a parent might not want for their child, then we would expand the last question, which is which application would you like to restrict your child's access? So are we explaining on here why we're giving them the option? Are we saying what's available, you know, for somebody who may not know what Epic is as a parent or 
be privy to any of this conversation? Are we telling them what, you know, why we're giving this option to opt in or opt out? So we do have a little blurb and we can let you see it at the beginning that kind of explains the board's Could you read that to us right now? For selection. <laughs> yeah. Sorry. Sorry. <laughs> um, but some of the other online apps that we uh, do use with students kind of allow for a little more tighter curation by the teacher. Whereas first, uh, with Epic, you do go on, there is a search engine and you can search. <coughs> there is also um, a high content um, process within Epic as well that if there is a particular title um, that, you know, we feel as a district maybe that that doesn't align, um, that we can put in there to hide that. Or if there were a particular resource that was challenged, because you do have a challenge process within the board policy, that if something were challenged uh, and it was deemed that it was not uh, what we want for our elementary students, for example, to have access to it, then we could instruct all of our teachers to hide that particular title and it would be hidden. By particular age groups or particular so, teachers so or? Within Epic, I as a teacher, I create a class and it gives my children an access code. And so they go onto their device they key in that access code and it gives you access to Millicent's classroom library. And within, so but within my classroom library, it's everything. But if, if we were to say, for example, the Blue Flowers book is, is one that we feel is not appropriate, then I could go in and key in that book and choose to hide it from my class of students. Mm -hmm. Why not? But if it were, if we deem that, that that's appropriate for middle school use of six, seven, or eight, then when those students go in and use their teacher's access, it wouldn't be hidden from them. So, two answers. One, I can read the application. Okay. But what I heard you say is, how are we going to communicate that this is even there? So, I'm hoping that our conversation tonight is continues to be a very positive one. And I would like for us to develop, that's why the epigraphic was graphic. This may not be what it lands on. I'm not saying it is. I'm saying this is a draft for a positive way to say this is what this resource provides. There may be topics in text that you don't feel are appropriate for your child, but it's more your preference than it's an actual violation of a policy. So we aren't choosing to exclude it because it's not promoting bias or stereotype. It's, it's meeting the aims of our board policy but you might not be comfortable with your child accessing that particular material. So you can challenge that particular material through KDC in that process, or you can say, you know what, I realize this has a lot of opportunity, but for my child, I would just rather them not have access to this application. And so then we would, that's when the opt-out process would be. But there was a letter we developed in the um, summer when we chose to restrict access. Like, there's lots of things about how we would present that in a family friendly way, um, but we are looking toward the opt out versus the opt in. And it's simply because some of our students who would need that resource as an opt in may not have a family that's able to do that. You know, we have a lot of students who need some help with pre and reduced lunch, but it, getting to that online application, online application and getting it done, sometimes that's a struggle for a variety of reasons. Mm -hmm. And so we would rather it be opt out so that folks can choose, but that for students who have parents that may not be able to or hear about it in the same means as others, they already have it there. But also maybe those parents are the ones we need to worry about a little bit more. True. And so we would need to figure out how we were going to communicate to the entire school population. And because so that's where we were going. I don't know much about Epic, but when I saw this on the board policy, I went in and I, I just kind of Googled and tried to find out as much as possible and talked to teachers that have, some teachers I know that have used it or didn't, or just knew about it. And three things that I kept getting, too much sex, too much swearing, and too much violence from some of the books in here. And one of the, the things that they had on, on the internet was, um, and this was in a classroom of six-year-olds. <laughs> so that's what I'm like, who, who's vetting this app and, and what are we, you know, having our parents opt in to, to sign up for their children to, to read? I mean, I know that 
you can Google anything, but how are we protecting the, the what's getting in front of our children? I understand reading's important, but how how are we making sure they're not reading the maybe things they shouldn't be reading? I would say okay. um, the use cases that I've seen are all positive. I have an inbox full of you've got to fight for this. It's got to come back. I understand some folks might not want it, but you've got to fight for this. Here's all the things it accomplishes for me. I have one email from a teacher in that stack that says there are things that might not be appropriate for my child. And what she, that particular person, gave a parent example, and it was about ghosts. So it's not any of those topics that you just said I keep getting. Like what's been flooding my inbox in doing the preparation for this has been We've got to have it back because we can do informational text searches that we cannot do in our media center. We can have discourse about text. We can do so many things. So it's been that positive slant. So I respect that you've heard the opposite. I totally do. And I will gladly continue to vet and figure out how we vet. Um, but we've definitely heard the opposite. We have heard the opposite. And so I also think, um, Sometimes it's, it's maybe a lesson in terms of, too, with students and their use of it, is that, you know, boys and girls today, we're going to be studying about um, robots, and so I have chosen this text, this group is going to read this text that you go in, and, and I've chosen for you this, and you, you type in the title, and you get that title, and that's the book that you, so I do think in terms of with teachers, there's oversight, too, that teachers can do as far as, working to steer students so that they're steered to content, you know, that's appropriate. Um, or And even, you know, if it's doing a, during a student's uh, free reading time or whatever, you're going to say, Millicent, these are the three books that I need you to key in and read today and, and be able to make sure that a child is reading reading those. But certainly, if, if there are books that are questionable, there are ways that we can have that content. So, and would want to. Like, yes, we need definitely. those titles brought forward to us. Out of curiosity, how long have we had Epic versus when this problem began? Is this, because if we've had Epic for eight years and it's a problem now, then I, I think that we're, what we're looking at is responding to something based on outside circumstances where you go, oh, somebody's found this book on this app. So then it became a whistle cry to everybody going, my kid has this app, therefore I don't want that. And, and that, you know, it's an understandable. And, you know, now we have topics that parents are using as whistle cries that say, this issue is a that issue, it's a race issue is a this. And that's what we're responding to. And personally, I think parents absolutely are the final say in what their child can be reading. But I would worry that somebody else is telling me that my child can't have access to something because it, they disagree with it. So to me, as a school and a school district, we want to offer the kids the world. And if I want to shelter my child from a title or whatever, that's an opt out. But I don't think that we say, well, every school, every classroom in Clover loses a library because we now have an issue with a couple titles and that's essentially what we've done is we've taken the classroom library out of every classroom in our elementary schools by removing epic to answer the question i think we've been using it for four or five years it was long before the pandemic that we began using epic um, i will say its use certainly increased when we could not bring our children into our classroom and we had no opportunities to share text and do read alouds and all of those things so its use became more prevalent during um, the pandemic, and it has remained when we return to the classroom because many teachers are creating collections that have none of those scary things, and they're directing their children to do uh, to visit this collection as opposed to search for content. And you do have plenty of teachers who don't give free time in Epic. It is literally we are doing this particular assignment and they are monitoring that assignment. It's not free, just free rank and read whatever. 
Did, didn't you say earlier that the teacher has to set up their own library, and those are the only books the children can see? They set up their own class. Own class. Okay. Class. okay. And then the access code. The access code that you mentioned earlier connects the children to the teacher. But is the access code generic for the entire class, or does each device have a different access code? You see, I would be concerned if I had any concerns at all. It would be that I opted out for my child. But since that access code is generic, little Johnny next in the next seat told me what the access code was. No, we would be removing the application altogether. Oh, so once they opt out, the app is taken off. They okay. opt out, the app is off their okay. device. Okay, that, that makes sense. The opt out is from the app altogether. And okay. Through our management system on their school device. Yes, ma'am. They have no access. Okay, I mean, that, I, that, I, that makes it all clear. I think clear. what you were asking is how do we make sure parents have the appropriate amount of knowledge in order to yes. make an informed choice? Right. That was one of the key things I think I heard from Ms. Stiff's question. And so what are some of the ways we would make sure parents understand what the app is and, and what it can do? I think that we need to add a piece to the infographic about topics that it provides that might be more diverse that would have opportunities for someone to not feel that that needed to be shared or share how they age collection. So if you're a first grader versus a fifth grader, like I think we would share those, those opportunities for protection and selection. Um, we would also, if a book is challenged, that book then gets removed from everybody's collection. Correct. If the book is challenged and it's deemed that it's not appropriate. So there is a process for parents to, to simply do that piece of it. Absolutely. And then what I think I also heard you say is if you had a situation in a classroom, an individual teacher could remove selections that may or may not meet the board policy standard. Absolutely. So are, let me just make sure I understand. So if they're in Dr. Dickey's classroom and Dr. Dickey has, has an umbrella of books, I couldn't go out and be mischievous and I couldn't search and other books pop up over here. I could only see what's in my classroom? You can, if, the, if, a, if I, have a, I have a classroom and yeah. if I, I practice hiding some books. Uh -huh. So if I tonight gave you my access code for my classroom, you couldn't go and type in the term that I used to hide a book and be able to pull that book if you're okay. using my access code. Okay. Now, if by chance, if she had a different access code and she hadn't yet hidden the book and you use her access code, you can and see can it. But it. if you have mine and you're in my class, you all are all in my class, you can't see any of the books that I tested in order to be able to hide. Okay. Okay, let me, let me, when I was growing up, it was everybody, read Are You There, God? It's Me, Margaret. That was just the book that we all read. If I'm in your class and my mother says, oh, no, you can't read that book, is it possible for Tracy and Mike and everybody else to read that book and just block it from my device with the other ones in there? So you could choose, um, you could decide to say, I could set up possibly two classes for my room. And if everyone shows that they all wanted, they wanted the access, they opted in, but there was one particular one that your mom said you, she didn't want you to have access to, I could set up a separate class that would hide it from just you. Or a small number of students. So an access code cannot grant access from, say, a curious third grader for getting a book that an eighth grader would read and have access to. This title shouldn't be in the library already. I'm going to be honest. Like, I'm going to have to go find these titles. So <coughs> I, I am. Like, I, because I really, I, I really, I wasn't looking for those. Those aren't the topics that I was looking for. I, I will be honest. Like, there were different filters I was applying. So, I don't think that there's middle school content. Like, it is sold as an elementary tool. Well, like, so I give the Lions Club books, and they absolutely, kids love the I Survive books. Mm -hmm. And they're violent. They're, they're I Survive World War II, I Survive, you know, the attack on whatever. And the images are graphic. And, and that's, you know, but that's an age appropriate one, and I can't get enough of them for all of the kids in, that want them. And so, to me, 
you, you kind of go, yes, you're, as a parent, you got to decide for your child. But you don't get to decide for everybody else. And you say, well, it's violent, it's whatever. Well, it, it's, you know, you're, you're studying World War One. You're studying the Civil War. That's what it is. And, and so I, I would question when we're looking at resources to say, well, if it's this, then you can't have it. Or if we go, okay, I really love Kwame Alexander's books, and, and you know, there's only one copy of this one in the library. This gives everybody an access to it. Whether or not you want your child to read it, then you could have that's a conversation between a parent and a child. Yes. I, mean, I think it's a microcosm, the epic app of what we have today, anyway. I mean, we don't be on the internet, and God knows what the kids can find on the internet. Every one of us in this room probably looked at things when we were 14 and 15 that if our mom and dads knew, would lose their minds. Uh, but, but I think to Tracy's <laughs> issue, it's just, you know, are we, is the district providing access to this material? Absolutely. And I mean, but here again, we provide access to the internet. And I know we have every stop gap imaginable to keep children off of sites they shouldn't be on, but we all know they still find them. Yeah, and it seems like the opt-in uh, op, opt option, excuse me, is the most safest because you have to opt-in. But I also see Ms. Sherry's side about, you know. To me, everything that we do as a district is an opt-out. If I don't want my child to take health, then he or she has to opt out. If I right. don't want my child, then you opt out because our job is to provide the children with the options for everything and then it's a parent's job to say you know what my child's not ready for that yet or i don't feel comfortable with them so the district we wouldn't say to a student to parents well your kid can't go to the library to the media center because there might be books in there and that's what this is it's a digital library for the kids and to say well you have to opt in to go to your teacher's digital library to me seems like it's an unfair burden for the parents who may or may not be able to do that and, and so you know and i have my child read one of the books that people question it's you know it was about families with differences and she read the book and it was there are step parents there are, and it listed all the different kinds of families and she did that because her room parents in her classroom were same gender parents and so there were parents who were offended by that, and my daughter had to say, you know, I'm sorry you're offended, but when we have a class party, they're gonna have two moms to the same child in that room, and so that's why I did it. And, and so she wasn't doing it to prove a point. She was doing it to say, this is the world we live in. And so the parents who are don't want their child exposed to that, that's, their choice to limit the world but that's not the world they live in our job is to say hey here are all these options if you want to opt your child out that's fine but there are other kids in that class and if we say we're just going to remove it and you have to opt into it we're limiting what we have for our children because well you know. the opt out is is fine i mean to to leave it up to a parent so we as a district are not put on the line and say you're letting my child read about sex. You're letting my child read about, you know, gender theory, or you're letting my child read about whatever. You know, that, that to me, yes, it's the world we're living in, but we don't have to, you know, we need to focus on reading, writing, and arithmetic. <laughs> we don't need to tell somebody how they need to think of this or this, and, what's, and I understand it's going on in the world, but I think as a district, we need to do a better job of vetting our books that we're giving to our, our students. Well, and I, th I think we need to tell our parents, you know, the goal of education, there are books, I am sure, in every library that are here to offend somebody, and that's the joy of books. You know, and I was traumatized when Charlotte died at the end of Charlotte's Web, but you don't pull the book because I cried for a week. You have the conversation, and this is a tool for parents to say, you know, these are our books. If your child is reading something, read it with them and have that conversation. Or say, I don't want you to read this book and this is why. Because ultimately, the parent 
is the foundation of what that child is going to do, but you can't say to them, well, you know, this doesn't exist. And there might be a child in that room, you know, if that child was same gender parents, that child has a right to feel comfortable in that room with his parents. And by normalizing it with that book, that child wasn't stigmatized by everybody going, ha ha, you have to, or anything like that. It's just what it was. I'll also Does say our board policy talks about text and instructional materials that have stereotype or encourage stereotype or bias. So having a topic in a book in a way that is inclusive does not necessarily mean that it is standing on one side or the other. And it does not mean that it is making any one side feel inferior to the other. There's definitely some legislation on that. And that's not the kind of titles that I was finding in searching for the titles that we would want to exclude. Any of the titles that had some hot topics in them, it wasn't promoting an idea or thought over another. It was literally, in the case of that family, it's here are the different ways that families can look. And I remember in elementary school talking about nuclear and blended and all kinds of other families. So it's in that same respect. There's just a few more categories. And that text saying that there are all the different ways isn't saying that any one of them is better than the other. And our policy is written in a way that it protects children from us telling them that this way or this way is the right way to think. And so we do need to do more figuring out how we vet, how we communicate that. But I do not think that there are stacks and stacks of titles that violate the policy as it's written. It might be nice to hear, Ms. Thunder, I see you're here, and I, would you please share how we do vet the books we're using, particularly those books that we teach as a unit to a class, and then those books that might be in a media center or on an app like this. How do we, how do we go about that process? Okay, good evening. Um, there's actually different processes depending on the kind of book. So for us, we look at three different levels. One is um, book selection for the media center. One is book selection for a fulcrum text for a class, and that's a book in which every student would be reading the same thing. And then we have another procedure for um, class book clubs or literature circles, where there's like an element of choice built into the reading. So with the media center, um, per board policy, the individuals who select our media um, center titles are the media specialists. And I just have to have a side note saying how blessed we are to have media specialists in all of our media centers. And they are not these individuals wearing a bun, telling people to be quiet. Um, they all have their master's degree in um, media special in media selection. They have their bachelor's degree in history and literature and elementary ed and, and middle school ed and, and secondary ed. And they follow a procedure. They hand select all of their titles. So during the school year, a media specialist might order anywhere between 100 and 450 titles during a year. And it comes from teacher requests. So a teacher might be doing a certain unit, and they want to branch out those titles to support the unit. It could be student requests, which is probably the most popular, where a student will come in and say, I really love reading about dogs. What do you have? Or there might be an, an author that they're drawn to. Um, it could come from just general weeding. So again, trying to get out of the old titles, bring in new titles, or adding more copies of titles that never stay on the shelves so they don't have those long lines. So once they decide that they want to order a book, then what they'll do is they'll curate a list and then they'll request a purchase order for that book to be purchased. They do not read every single title from start to finish prior to that because that doesn't fit into the process. In order to get a purchase order, you have to have a list. So you have to turn that in first. Once the books come in, um, then the media specialist will spend their time reading as many titles as they can. So how do they know that the content is appropriate for their group? They depend on reviews, and lots of them. Not Amazon.com reviews, but they go to professional resources, and there's a whole list. I have about six of them that they go to. So Kirkus or Hornbook, they depend on these professional sources to read what is inside the book and what other people have said about the book. Um, many of our media specialists also go to commonsensemedia.com. That's not a professional source, but that is a parent run source that will actually outline everything in the book that's appropriate and not. And there's even a section that says what parents need to know. So within that site, they'll say, yes, you might come across these things. However, if it's appropriate, here are the reasons why. They outline both sides. 
They also talk to one another, and they join many different media specialist pages, and they talk about books. So once they have gone through that whole process, that's how the books land on the list, that's how they get purchased, and then that's how they get shelved. So that's the media specialist part of it. Um, for fulcrum texts, for books that are taught to everybody within a class, um, those are chosen by teachers initially. Um, I'm part of that approval process. There is a whole form I can share with you that walks through what teachers think about when they purchase a fulcrum text. And there's a lot because there are books out there that are great reads, but they're not teachable. So they're looking things like literary merit, historical merit. They're looking at does it have um, complex characters or plot lines, allusions to other texts, does it make connections to other subject areas. There's a whole list of things that they consider before making a fulcrum text. We used to be able to do that through conversation. Um, about a year and a half ago, we put that conversation into a Google Doc form. So now any teacher that wants to introduce a new fulcrum text, they have to fill out that form and get it approved ahead of time. The book clubs and literature club selections are a little bit different because of the element of choice. So a fulcrum text is saying this is the best of what we got, so everybody's going to read it. In a book club selection, they might offer 10 to 12 titles um, that relate. It could be a certain theme. It could be connecting to a fulcrum text, like spinoffs. So sometimes we have modern um, versions of like Romeo and Juliet that might turn into a book club. Because there is an element of choice, we do require that um, they read all the books from start to end, just like you would a fulcrum text. Um, they outline how they're going to use that book, what unit is it going to be connected to, what activities they're going to do with it, and then the principal is the one that approves the book club list um, prior to being started. All of these things are completely transparent. So if you were to go to the district website, you'll see every single fulcrum text selection. It's already published and out there, and we update that as books come in. For literature clubs, the, the teachers advertise what those are, so they send letters home that list all the book titles, all the descriptions. Um, they have parents sign off on a literature club, our book club selection before it actually starts. And every teacher will proudly and gladly engage in a conversation. So if a parent were to come forward and say that they are concerned about a fulcrum <coughs> text or they're concerned about a book club option, teachers want a conversation. So it gives them a chance to go on the phone or sit face to face and talk through the concerns. And a lot of times that's where it ends because an alternative novel might be given or a parent might suggest a book that would work well for their child for that book club and the teachers accommodate in that way. Would you talk a little bit about young adult books too? What process we have in place for parents on that? Um, we talk about the, the media, media center. center. Mm -hmm. All right, so in the media center, our elementary students do not have access to young adult titles. So we have these little filters behind the scenes as far as when we're selecting books. Um, our high school, I mean, our middle school students, there are young adult titles that are available in the middle school center. They are clearly marked as young adult, and when the people are c coming in to check out, they tend, there's certain titles that might only be appropriate, let's say for like eighth grade and above. So if a student is coming in and they're checking out a young adult title, our middle school media specialist will have a little conversation with that person first. You know, are, are you sure that this is appropriate? Is this something your family supports? Um, they have that little conversation and they encourage it to bring it back immediately if a family member does not want them to have that book. Our high school has access to young adult and a few select adult titles, but again, our media specialists, they hand pick the titles. So they pay attention to what students are interested in, they look at their reviews before purchasing it. Our other resource is Sora, which you might have heard a little bit about. Do I want to go that direction? Okay, Sora, <laughs> Sora is an online digital library that is completely empty until our media specialists put books into it. So the process for selecting books into Sora are just like the same process for the Media Center. So again, they consider each title, they look at the reviews before they put the digital copies into Sora. Those do have filters. So our elementary students can only have access to children's literature. That's it. Our middle school has access to children's and juvenile literature, and that's it. Our high school has access to children's, juvenile, and young adult. That's it. There is no access to adult um, through that app. So I have a question. Yeah. So if one school decided to take a book, to remove a book because of issues that they've had with the book, why would it not be taken out of every library in our district? 
the time that would happen if a book went through the right process. So if someone brought a book title of concern and it, the individual filled out that form and we had a committee come together to talk about that book, that becomes a universal decision. That's what the committee is for. So um, as far as individually removing books, maybe it came from a, a concerned parent just from that school and they, they found issue with it and they choose to pull it, but maybe at another school it wasn't a concern and so they let it stay, and if it didn't go through the process of the review, it doesn't necessarily have to be uniform. That process part is important. If someone is looking to remove a title from multiple students other than their own, they can do that, but they have to go through the process, and that's how it goes and impacts multiple schools. <coughs> can a parent request that, the book to go through that process? Oh, absolutely. Yeah, that's part of the school board policy. I think it's the KEC. So that they found a book in the media center or as part of instruction that they want to remove from everybody, right. All right, then what you'd have to do is go through that form and then a committee will be pulled together to discuss that book and then a decision would be made across the board. And then just also within that policy, that KEC, the parent that makes the complaint, they must read the entire work. They can't pull it on a basis of a word or a sentence. It has to be the entire work. I've served on those committees. And that, you know, it, it's a well, diary of a wimpy kid taught kids to be disrespectful. Someone thought Harry Potter was satanic. And, and parents, you have that right for your child. But again, you know, you have to look at the entirety of the book. And ha have we had books go through that process that passed muster and was kept in the library? Or have we always gone through the process and the book has been removed? You see what I'm asking? I mean, have we used the process we used the to the benefit of everyone instead of a few individuals? Um, so yes, sir, so we have. I think in my time in this role, I've maybe only had one or two challenges. Yes, ma'am. Uh, because sometimes I, I will say, um, there have been instances where I explain the process to an individual and say, you have to read the entire document and you must fill out this form to state your complaint. It just can't be a verbal phone call. Then sometimes people won't necessarily follow through with the exact process. But I think in my time in this role, maybe there's been one book okay. removed, I believe, but I can't speak to what before that. Yes, so the issue at hand board is, the, the, the way the policy is written is that there would be an opt-out option for parents. That's the new part we have added. And that's what we want to be sure, at, per this conversation, when we bring it back to you for first reading, that that is the language you want in this policy. <coughs> Do you want an opt-out policy? And this is this is just the first reading. This is just the discussion. Yesterday. Right. We're just discussing today. Right. First reading will be at the board meeting in September, the business meeting. Yes, and then the second reading, it'll be adopted. So how soon, once we go through the process, if we decide to, can we get the epic app back? You don't finalize on second reading till October board meeting, so business October. meeting. So it'll be, it'll be, sorry, the end of October um, before we will be able to bring it back because we will have a process formally approved by the board of what we do with that. Otherwise, it would have to be a called meeting to approve that? Well, it goes through two readings. So but this September, yes, you could at the October work session do a special call reading to do that if you wanted to do that. Day. You sure could. So that would be two weeks earlier? Two weeks earlier. Yeah, how I quickly would, could IT get it back into the vices if we chose to? Beth, how back? quickly could we bring it back if the board puts the? That's what I thought. Yeah, I would support an opt out. I would not support an opt in option. I think that it should be a parent's choice to remove that for their personal child only, and then go through the process if it were a larger issue to them. Oh, for all children for specific books, but not for the app itself. I, so I think there's, uh, I mean, there's just too many benefits to have. I mean, this is where we are. We, we've been using Kindles and everything else for years. This is Amazon <laughs> books and everything. We ha our, our books are online. I mean, it's, it's just where we're going. It's cheaper. It's easier for the school district in the long run and to take a library away. I mean, I don't think we would ever opt in to like a library visit. And so um, I like that there's processes if, if something comes up and they have to be heard. So. I'm good with opt out, but I want some 
I wanted to explain what, what their a strong right, education like campaign. Yes. That's, that's what I was going to say too. I would support an opt out campaign, but I think we need to to do some more <laughs> to do some more due diligence in what the communication plan would be to parents to make sure that everyone this is two separate things. Is it the board policy that's saying in general we're gonna develop an opt out process for any application the, the policy that was being reviewed was before there was an issue that was being called a question in Epic. So the policy was to put a play, thing in place for vetting um, digital resources. And so then in the midst of that being reviewed, we're also reviewing one that might be in that process. So could it be two separate things, not trying to rush things, but saying, could we develop that process for Epic that fits what you would be changing in policy later, like develop it as a solution? I think what you're asking is could we potentially use Epic sooner if we had a process, but I, because the policy, just because you wouldn't hold it up for the because policy. Because the current policy doesn't have anything about this at all. So what she's basically saying is if, if they develop the opt-out process for this specific resource, but you take the policy through its full extension, would the board be comfortable with that process if you were made aware of what that process was for that particular app. That's what I'm asking. Can or do you want it to wait for the policy? Because because we, you've been using it all this time and haven't had a policy that kept it from being used until now. So that's what you're asking, right? Mm -hmm. I'm saying we removed it without a whole lot of process and, and, and conversation. And we didn't communicate that very well at all. And now I have lots of people asking me and demanding to have it back. And you know what I mean? Like I, I really, we I understand protection. I want to work through with all due diligence what you're saying to me. I'm not discounting that one bit. So why did you pull it? I asked, I asked it to be pulled because I felt like we needed to vet the policy okay. and put in a procedure in place for okay. parents to have so, an so option. It was, it was so removed without due process. And but so there was a but there was no problem. Yeah. yeah, there was yeah. no policy that reflected it. And when we began to take this policy up, I said that one applies, and we need some potential language right. that gave parents more information and more control. So, so I think we need to wait until the policy is done. But that's just my one seven. How much? How much time would we give the parents to opt in or opt out once we decide to change the policy and? I mean, as soon as the opt out them. process is there, it's a Google form and it is two or three clicks for them to cobble. But I mean, do we give them a day? Do we give them a week? Do we I give them? But the reality is they can opt out now. They can now. Okay. They, they, they could, if I'm a parent and I have a problem with something my child is reading in Epic and I brought my iPad to that right. person at the building, it would be gone. But what I mean is they can't opt out right now because it's not on their devices. Can. But I mean, it's not on their yeah, devices. So no, they can't. Yeah, but but once, it's, once it's on their devices, they could opt out at any, at any time. Um, you, could, you could have it on your device, but, you know, three months from now, you could decide. Right. So they may say it's fine in October, in January, they run across something they don't like. Yes. But don't you have to get the form ready and, and send it out? The form okay. ready. We can start it with a draft letter, and so we probably need to do some uh, adjusting to that letter and whatnot in the form, and also just some infographic type things as well to parents so that they are aware of exactly what it is and what they're saying that they wish to opt out of. All right, so what I'm hearing in summary is we're going to continue with this policy. We're going to develop this process. We're going to present this process to the board so they feel comfortable with it before we do anything. But we, if the board is comfortable with our process, the policy will continue and the process may be implemented with this particular so app prior. The policy prior. will go through first reading and second reading in September and October regular meetings. And it just simply says that we will have an opt-out process for parents. In the so meantime, the we'll policy. be developing that process. But in the, in the meantime, we can give you and massage what that lo process looks like. So that when you're hearing updates on the reading, you can also see the supplementary materials that would Company Board, if you'd like that to be a part of the September business meeting, we can we can bring that form to you and bring you that process. I think if we can, um, however we can expedite this, expedite it would be preferable. Okay. All right. Mm -hmm.
Thank you. Thank you for that. We'll bring it to you in September. All right. Thank you, instruction team. All right. Hang in there. We've got two more. I know we're policy heavy tonight, but um, we've had waited a long time to get some policies in front of you guys. Dr. Hemingway, bring it home. I know we always put you at the end, and you always have to go I fast. had a great show planned for you all tonight, <laughs> but because of time, I will not be able to do it. <laughs> So we're going to look at the policies uh, that we have for first reading for September. And um, these policies are actually in personnel, both of these, yes. right? So. And so um, actually I had uh, the four policies, some were discussed tonight, and these are all the policies that we'll have in September. In addition, we'll add the field trip policy, the third party policy, and then the IJ and BB rule to this list. And so in the GBEF, this is cell phones and other electronic communication devices. And so we currently do not have a policy, but the School Boards Association has a model policy that we would like to adopt. And what we would like to add to that is including accessing social media websites for non-school related business. And so if you look in the policy, the policy talks about or kind of governs how we are to use or not use our personal devices and uh, during the school day for um, non-district related business. And so the key thing that we want to add to change that is access to social media websites if it's for non-related businesses. We have uh, schools and clubs that have Twitter pages, Instagram pages, Facebook pages, and we want to encourage that use of highlighting things that are happening in classrooms or around the district on those. But when it comes to the personal use of social media, we would like to kind of have some guidance to say, you know, what's appropriate and not appropriate when it comes to using those tools. Well, you've raised some concerns about social media use by staff during the school day. We did not have a policy specific to that. This would give us a policy specific to that. And again, Tony's right. We do tweet out good things that are happening. There are Instagram. Those are not what we're talking about. We're talking about personal Facebook, personal. Any questions my, on that? Oh, go ahead. My question would be, I, I always have an issue having a policy where there's no, I mean, what, what do we do if we catch somebody doing that? What is the, what is the next step? I mean, we have a policy that says you should not use your device. I mean, how are we going to monitor that, regulate that, and punish that if that? So it's a great question. And so w within our board policies, we talk about what's um, professionalism. And there is a clear process for documenting professionalism or the act of violating the, the board policy. So the first thing that you have to do is have that conversation where you meet with the staff member and say, this is the policy that you violated and this is how it caused a disruption to the school. And so that's a general conversation that we encourage all principals to document if it you know, has happened or not. And within that conversation and the letter, you clearly state what will happen if this is not done. So one of the board policies talk about insubordination. And if we have made it very clear that this is our policy and this is something that we do not expect, then it's insubordination when someone is doing something in contrast to what we've communicated is what, not what they're supposed to do. But we just have to make sure we're being consistent and that we're being fair when it comes to how we number one, interpret the policy, and then how we enforce the policy. So it could be a warning, it could be a termination, all the way, depending on the level of disruption or the number of times it happens. Okay. Is that in there? Yeah. So up to and including termination is okay. in, the, in the policy. Thank you, sir. And so we have the acceptable use of technology which Beth presented and then proficiency-based uh, credit courses, which Dr. Dickey presented. And so the fun part tonight is policy GCCAA, which I'm is so our sick bank policy. And this one has been on the docket for a while, and it's something that has come up a lot of times in conversation as we have people who were approved or not approved for a sick bank policy. And so what we wanted to do was kind of fine tune that process and that policy so that it meets the needs of our, our staff. Uh, we know that when the policy was initiated, there are lots of things that have happened and that have changed when it comes to people's health. And so we want our policy to reflect those changes and be able to uh, provide that support for our staff. 
And so there are three outcomes that we have. Number one is just understanding the policy. We know that we have a sick bank policy. I don't think everyone fully understands what the policy was designed to do. And then we want to participate in a mock sick bank request. So in a folder that I gave you guys earlier, you have a request for sick bank leave. And I want to walk you through that process of how we determine if the person is going to receive that um, the days for the sick bank policy. And then we want to look at what revisions do we make to this policy to make sure that it is what you know its intended purposes are. And so the very first thing you, in your, your packet, you have sick bank, uh, sick leave bank regulations. And we want to look at what do we know about the sick bank. And so the page that uh, you should look at is this page um, that talks about sick bank regulations. And so what we know is that when we're looking at a sick bank, it's for catastrophic illnesses. And these are defined as illnesses that extend over 20 or more working days. And then we look at the eligibility, who's eligible for uh, sick bank leave. And so to be eligible, there are certain criteria that must be met. And if you look under the eligibility page, there are three areas where um, the employee must meet in order to be approved for sick bank. And so if we look at those quickly, they must be a current member, which everyone is, is, is kind of like you're automatically a member unless you opt out of uh, the sick bank. So oh, there's that opt out word, which is very consistent with, with what we do. Um, so we take one sick leave day from each employee, and if they decide, hey, I do not want to participate in sick, sick bank, then they can choose not to by opting out. Uh, then the employee must have been out of work for 20 or more work days as a result of the same catastrophic illness or accident, or it could be uh, also applied to their immediate family. And then last, um, the employee has exhausted all annual accumulated sick leave. So there are two prongs there. They must be out of all of their sick personal vacation days if they get those, and then the illness must have them out of work for 20 work days. And so that's what the eligibility is. And then we look at the application process. There's a process in place for them to apply. Uh, currently, uh, we have a sick bank board in place. And if they are denied sick bank leave, they can appeal to that sick board who then relooks at the, uh, the application if there's new information, a new doctor's note that has been provided. And then they make that determination of if they're eligible or not. And then when we look at the exclusions on here, the member who um, have been approved for workers' compensation due to job-related injury will not be eligible uh, for sick bank leave. So what that, what that says is if you're out um, for workers' comp, then you won't be approved for those additional days. And then the final is additional sick leave days cannot be granted for illnesses or hospitalizations due to a normal present pregnancy beyond the employer's uh, employees annual and accumulated leave except for in extreme cases and they go along to list what those cases are. So we have had this uh, very comprehensive plan in place for a number of years and we know that throughout the years it's caused some angst in some employees who have been denied and we've had several conversations about trying to explain the reasons why that leave was denied and looking at the policy and making sure that everything fits the policy to the letter. And so what do we hope to achieve today? What we hope to do is look at what our policy says and see what changes we can make so that the policy does take into consideration that there are some nuances that may not 100% fit in the way the policy is written in its current state. And so. First, I want to talk about what is the sick bank and then what the sick bank is not. And so the sick bank is extended leave for prolonged illnesses, catastrophic illnesses extending over 20 working days. And then we also have to make sure that all of your annual leave is exhausted before you can access the sick bank. And then you have to have a doctor's note that confirms the nature and duration of the illness. So when we look at what it's not, a, a lot of people like to use the sick bank as a short-term disability policy, meaning that, you know, I still have my sick days, I contributed one day to the sick bank, 
I'm choosing to have this surgery. It's not catastrophic, but I'm going to tap into the sick bank to cover these days for me. And that's, that's not what the policy was de designed for. And then they try to use it uh, sometimes as reimbursement of days that they've taken. Like if they've had to take sick days and they've exhausted all those days, and then I get a cold, I have the flu, and I don't have any days to take, I want to tap into the sick bank to cover or make up for those days that I lost. That's not what the policy was designed for. So when we look at um, your, in your uh, packet there, you have a mild sick bank, and we won't go through the entire thing, but in that packet you have, you have an application that has been completed with the reason for why they want to be out sick. And so if you could just take a few minutes to just kind of browse over what that board receives and reviews in order to determine if they're going to grant the days for the sick bank. For those of you who are in the audience and you don't have a copy of the packet, uh, what it is is uh, a person who is requesting leave after they've exhausted their days for whatever the illness is. They have the doctor's note in there to kind of explain why they need the days and what the nature of their illness is. So this will be the same information that the board would receive. While we're reading, how, how often does the sick banks meet? We meet uh, once a month. And it, 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 it depends on how many applications we receive. When we receive a a certain number within that month, there may be a second meeting. Mm, uh, so far this year, we haven't had any. Yeah. So uh, typically, we'll have maybe two or three every other month not bad. And you should have a list in your packet that kind of gives you an overview of the past year of what requests we've had and if those requests have been denied or approved. You should have that list as well. So for the sake of time, in your packet you have two blue sheets. The sheet that's on top is new language that we would like to propose and then the the second sheet is old language. So if you look at that old language, there were five questions that sick bank board members completed um, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a meeting, whenever we had a board meeting. And we would tally up the yeses and noes to determine if that request was approved. And you'll see this green sheet at the very end, that's the tally sheet that, the, um, that I would get as HR director in tallying up the yeses and the noes. And you'll see here if there were 30, there are 35 total responses, if there are 20 plus yeses, then the leave is granted. But if there are 19 or fewer, then the leave is denied. And so, you know, I've been in this role for going on six years. And when I first came into the role, this was just a process. There wasn't really uh, an understanding of how we arrived to the process, how we got to the questions that were asked. They were kind of uh, based off of what the definition of catastrophic is. When you look at that policy to determine if it's catastrophic, that was uh, the, the basis of how we determined if the leave was approved or not. And so I want to pause here to give you an opportunity to ask any questions or to kind of reflect on what you feel are opportunities we have to improve this process. And then I would like to share with you um, just some things that we thought about in HR. We've met with Dr. Quinn. We've uh, also consulted with Dr. Dickey, who was in HR prior to, to um, my turn in HR, and just kind of ask some questions of what can we do to make this process better? How can we make this process a little more inclusive for some of the new things that could be happening with employees' health who have exhausted their sick days. So any questions from the board or any recommendations? Does it cover mental health? It does not. Well, I take that back. If a doctor has written the employee out for a mental health reason and it was unforeseen or, or met those definitions of catastrophic, then that would be 
Tony, did you say that the blue sheets, the top or the bottom is the new one? So the one that was on top is the new sheet, new and, sheet. I'll, uh, and I'll explain later what has changed on the sheet that we would like to include in the new process. So you've taken out the days, the number of days, consecutive days. In the, on the new sheet? On the new sheet, yeah. So I'll, I'll skip ahead. So on the, so on the old no. sheet, no, that's fine. So on the old sheet, if you look at question four, it says that the employee is going to be out of work for the next 30 days. And that was a huge factor in considering mm -hmm. if that employee was approved for sick bank leave or not. In the new sheet, there are three key changes here. One is the definition intermittently. And what that means is, in the old policy, you had to, you, the illness had to last for 20 days and 20 consecutive working days. What we've come to realize is a person may be diagnosed with an illness that doesn't require them to be out 20 consecutive days. It may be that they go intermittently. They may have to go two days this week and two days the next week. And so we wanted to take that into consideration and make sure that if that is the case, if it's an illness that is gonna be prolonged, it was unforeseen, but it's not necessarily 20 consecutive days, we still wanna provide coverage for that. And so that's, that's one of the key differences you'll see in the questions that are being asked to determine if the And then the granted. next 30 days, go, go into that one too, in question four. Question four. Why did so you take that out? Yeah, so we took out um, from working for the next 30 school days because that just may not be the case. They may be able to come back and then the doctor may say, come back in two weeks. And if they're not out, if the application doesn't indicate that they're going to be out for those 30 days, then that leave was denied because of that question. If you think about people who have illnesses and they require chemotherapy and other things, sometimes your time out is not all consecutive 20 days this or 30 days that. Mm -hmm. It's very much cyclical, but it's ongoing, it's catastrophic, it's life changing. And so that's what we part of what we're trying to clean up here. Mm -hmm. uh, we were having to deny some things that maybe didn't feel really right to deny because they weren't meeting the letter of the law and the way that was worded. So essentially, this application, which was originally denied under the new rules, would be approved. Mm -hmm. And the sick bank will never apply to workers' comp because they're getting compensated for the other means. That's correct. And is there a, um, a limit on how far out you can, and how far back you can go to request it? Um, there, let's see, it's calendar year, it's within that school year. So if somebody got denied two years ago, they can't come back now and say, hey, I want to reapply because the rules have changed. Gotcha. So Tony, those were two major changes, which I think the board understands. Were there other any major changes in the sections in red? that you want to draw their attention we're to? Gonna go, getting ready we're to go? go okay. That. okay. So if we look at the current policy, this kind of goes through uh, where we are now with our sick bank board. And so the key language changes are in all of these bullets. We want to look at the board, the actual makeup of the board as a, um, a change, changes to the policy right now. What it says is that the members, there have to be a percentage of the membership that decides on the changes and what we would like to do is have that change to the, to the actual school board as the changers of the policy, which is in line with all of the other policies that we have in the district. We rely on the school board to make those changes and not a separate board with, of our employees to make those changes. We wanna look at the definition of uh, catastrophic and, and, um, and make sure that we include that language um, intermittently we want to look at the appeal process. With the appeals process, and I, I think I have these on the next slide, whenever the application is denied, the board appeals to that same, or the employee appeals to the same board to make that decision. And so we feel like there should be a fresh set of eyes on the application. So we have a board in place, and then the appeal 
will be made to myself or Dr. Quinn or the both of us to determine if we're going to uphold or deny what the board has recommended. Because sometimes it could be uh, something as simple as a misunderstanding of the application. And, but we also feel that with the new questions that we have, it should be pretty clear as to if a person needs or is approved for that, that bank. And then when we talk about the usage, um, as you see, it was in the old policy, it talked about, let's look here, um, with the usage, uh, there was nine, there 90 days and then a two year waiting period after using 80 days of the, of the bank. So they are eligible for up to 90 days of sick leave. But there's nothing in our policy, and, and, and what I did with making the changes, I looked at our area, uh, our, our surrounding districts policies to see what they had that was unique and, some, and, and what we didn't have as a part of our policy that we may want to consider. And so in some of those policies, after using 90 or 80 days of sick bank, they were not eligible or for at least two years for using the bank again. Um, and then the illness, the definition, we talk about an illness over 20 or more working days. Uh, and we excluded, uh, excludes elective surgery and normal pregnancy. And then the word intermittent is one that we wanted to add to that. And that's the ongoing illness that may require the employee to use sick leave at intermittent times. And we currently do not have that. But what this says is that the employee may return to work. In the old policy, they have to be out of work all of those days before being eligible. What, what happens if you? God forbid, miss more than 90 days. Then what do we do? So if you if you miss more than 90 days, the sick bank will cover. That's what I mean. What if we've used up our 90 then your doc sick pay. bank days? Yes, okay. So yeah, so then your doc pay at that point. Okay. So what the sick bank prevents is a person missing pay right. while they're out sick. But after using 90 days, which is what the sick bank will allow, then you, that's when but you I mean, do we do we terminate okay. employment, or do they just not get paid, and do they get a position when they're well enough to come back? So we have had in the past where we've had employees who have been out for an extended period of time that it's extended effort. So what you're talking about is FMLA, and with FMLA, there are a certain number of days that you can be out and have your job protected. And so when it comes to that time period where you have exhausted all of those days, then we can make a decision of, do we want to put a substitute in this position? Do we want to re-staff um, that position and hold it for the employee to return? Or do we want to go ahead and post and have someone new come in? So it's going to depend on a lot of times how critical that position is to have someone in place. So for example, if you had a building principal out from an elementary school or, or whatever school, right. and that principal has exhausted the 90 days, well, we know that the school can't function without a principal. And so we will want to get a principal in that position to run the school and then make a decision of if we want to have the principal who was out on sick leave come back in another role or a similar role. Okay. So that's kind of how we would have to determine that. Tony, does a doctor determine what's elective surgery and what's not elective surgery? We rely heavily on the doctor's note to determine because it will, will a lot of times in the application, have them put that in there from the doctor and the doctor will determine if it's catastrophic or if it's something that is. Other questions from the board? This is a complex policy and process. Yes. That requires um, a lot of judgment, but we tried in this policy, Tony done a really good job of trying to clean up where the gray areas were that were causing some sticky issues. Mm -hmm. And I think it's a much better version. I would encourage you to kind of look over it some more when it's not so late. Um, we're gonna bring it back to you for first reading and back again for second mm -hmm. and be prepared to maybe give Tony some more questions if you haven't been. Um, but we, uh, we really want to see this policy work better. And the other thing I will say that we've debated is you only give once to the sick bank, that one time, that one day. What if the days run out? Oh, and you don't give one a year. No, you don't give one a year. No. That's a lot of the misconceptions. So we've got all these days out there. No, you give one Just 
day. And so that's our finite bank. And so we want to be very careful in how we administer it, but we also want to be as loving and caring and supportive as we can. But so. why is that? Like, why do you limit it? That is just... That's just the way that the, the policy has been written. Yeah, there are some and places that don't. Yeah, and, and so one don't. of the things that uh, our policy says, and you'll see, um, is that when it comes to the membership, if the, the, the sick bank requires an additional day to be donated by the employees, they can decide at that point if they want to continue in the bank or not. So if they don't, if, if uh, the sick bank board decides, hey, we need another day from everyone, and somebody says, well, I don't want to give another day, then what they're doing is elected to not participate in the sick bank. But we they're opting out. Op they're opting out. <laughs> But that's what some districts do. Yeah, they're up but, and out. But would it not make life easier all the way around just to, to not have that cap of one per? If that's what the board wanted, we could we could propose a different language in the policy on that. Mm -hmm. I mean, yeah, I feel like it's up to that individual. Yeah. I mean, if they if they never use their days and they want to donate or they want to. We've make, got currently yeah. 1,907 days. Is that? Mm -hmm. That's so, right. But, but in order to stay in the sick bank, to be a member of the sick bank, you have to donate that day. And so if we're requesting a day each year, and at some point someone says, oh, I'm not going to donate that day, then they're choosing to opt out. Right. So we have not, we've gone less intrusive. We've just yes. done one. And so far we've been able to manage with just mm -hmm. one. So I'm not trying to paint a dire picture. I'm just right. saying that yeah. There's not an unlimited number of days. And I can see the one being required to be a part, but if you wanted to do more, you should have that option. So when people retire, and um, so right now, we, you can carry over 90 sick days. And so each year, you get additional days. And so I, I think right now, I have like maybe 100 sick days. And so at the end of this year, uh, the district will pay you out for the days you have over 90 and then 90 will carry over. So if I got to, to retirement age and I still have those 90 days, I can choose to donate those 90 to the sick bank. And that's how we get a lot of days is by people who retire donating those days, but we only ask for one day. So I've been a member of the sick bank for a lot of years and I've never used it. I've never but you could. I mean, it's there. It's the potential it's there. is there if you need if it. If I needed yeah. it, yes. You don't want to need, need it. it. I don't. Well, need yeah. It. Nobody <laughs> wants to need it. Is there a way employees can go? Because I, I, I guarantee you, there are probably employees that have forgotten whether or not they have donated. So at at this point, it's an opt out. It, it's, it's, it's an opt out. So yeah, first, yeah, yeah, once you first come into the district, that very first letter that you see in your packet, that's mm -hmm. what. Um, that's what they get a copy of, okay. letting them know that they are. Now that's, that's just new employees. I'm saying you might have a teacher that's taught for 22 years and they've forgotten whether they donated or not, and then they well, get they cancer. I, <laughs> I've been in a long time, too, okay. but I know that I'm in the, in okay. the, in the sick bank. Um, they, sh they should know. Yeah. They, they should know. Right. The but you know, sometimes it just slips people's, you know, after they've been there so long. Yeah. And this applies to all employees? All employees, mm -hmm. all employees. And so this is something else that we're changing here, rights to use the uh, bank are canceled if, and so once you become terminated from the district, you can't access the bank. Um, if there is a cancellation of sick leave bank participation by the member, which means you choose to opt out. If you're gainfully employed while you're sick and requesting uh, sick bank leave, then that will make you ineligible for that as well. And then falsifying or, you know, any documents or supporting documents or receiving disability will also cause you to be ineligible for the sick bank leave. And we didn't have that as a part of our policy. The only thing we had, I think, was, um, I can't remember, there was like, there was one or two sentences that we had. Um, if you were approved for workers comp, we had that one. And um, and if it was a normal pregnancy, we had that. But we didn't have these other things in here that Fort Mill and York's policy included that I thought was important for us to add. 
And these are just a copy of the questions just to show you how they change the current uh, side. That's the first uh, blue sheet. And then the recommended are those uh, ones in red that we want to add the intermittent there and then take off the 30 days. Any questions? Thank you for taking a look at it. I think it would be a better policy um, for people. And I think you guys will probably receive less, <laughs> less <laughs> inquiries about uh, decisions, policy decisions. All right, that concludes the policies for the night. Again, I know that was a lot, but we've been saving these. We've needed your input, and we're in a school year now, so it takes two readings now so we can get these policies in place and, and change some things that we think are important. So. Um, Ms. Madam Chair for the night, I don't have any other information. Okay. Any other business? All right. Well, adjourn. Thank you, everybody, for being here. Great job. Oh, mercy.